o'clock, we have a special meeting of the Enfield House Authority. Uh, Mr. Scott Bertrand. How you doing, sir? Doing well. Floor's yours. You want to come up? Yeah. I have a hand up, may I? Sure. Go right ahead. Uh, good evening. I'm Scott Bertrand, Executive Director of the Housing Authority. Thank you. Um, and actually, I'm pleased to start off by giving you a copy of our annual report. You guys usually get this email to me to you or send the mail, so uh, this show you have to take it. Uh, <laughs> save money. Yeah, save on the stamps, but uh, extra on the printing. Thank you. Uh, this comes out every January, so I'm very pleased to be able to Thank give you a copy. It was presented to the Board of Commissioners and the Housing Authority last yeah, week. Yeah, we should take one more for each of oh, our new sure. people who are coming next week. I'll put them on the Thank, Thank you very you. much. And while Scott's handing that out, I can just give you a little background. Um, I've met with Scott a couple of times because they have this project that's coming up, which I think is very exciting for the Housing Authority and the town and our residents. And also in keeping with what we've been doing lately um, to sort of bring people in and let them showcase and explain, what does the Housing Authority do? Um, what is the housing that's available? Uh, what are the criteria for somebody to be eligible? I just think it's good. A lot of people know about it, but then, as I say, all of this is perishable. So I think it's wonderful Scott agreed to come, give you the report, and he's really going to talk about the project, but then he's just going to give, and he's given me a lot of other good information about eligibility and whatnot we won't get into. Uh, I kind of promised him, given his time frame, we talk about the project, but I think he can give an overview just about, you know, how they serve the town, uh, the number of units, and sort of just that broad uh, perspective and then he can give uh, go into the specifics of this project but I thank you for coming Scott your openness uh, your cooperation and for all the good you do for Enfield we thank you well, thank you very much uh, I prepared a PowerPoint I promise it will not be death by PowerPoint and I did not make it over I hope but uh, certainly any feedback will be welcome uh, again I'm Scott Bertrand I'm the executive director of the Housing Authority and uh, I prepared this, and I'd like to also introduce, I brought, uh, I had some people tag along with me tonight. Um, I have members of the Board of Commissioners. I have um, uh, William Ballard, who's the chair, our new vice chair, Mr. Howard Coro, uh, Barbara Lawrence, treasurer, um, Mary Ellen Carrasca, uh, who I should assistant note is, treasurer. is assistant treasurer and commissioner, but I should also note is my predecessor, who uh, <laughs> retired 17 years ago. Uh, when I came on board with the Housing Authority. And Mr. Jorgensen uh, was not able to make it tonight. Uh, so moving on, a little history and background about us. Uh, some of this you folks probably already know. Um, most of you, or if not everybody, but for the viewers at home, uh, the Enfield Housing Authority is a standalone entity. Uh, we work with the town of Enfield, but we are not the town of Enfield. Uh, that was designed by state statute, and it's pretty much the same case across the country. Uh, it was designed to be separated for a number of different reasons historically. Uh, so yes, when Chris calls me, I, I do pick up the phone, but uh, I don't work directly under him. I do report to the Board of Commissioners. We've been around for quite a while, actually it, it, since 1948. And it was the, the then, I guess, the Board of Selectmen probably, right back in the 40s, that created the housing authorities when the cities and towns were given the opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, so we're one of the older ones, actually. Uh, many of them came about in the 50s, but we started in 48. The ball really didn't get going into the 50s. As I mentioned, we have a five-member board of commissioners, and as you guys know, you appoint them, and they're on five-year terms. Uh, one thing that's interesting uh, here in Connecticut, and same with many other states, one of the uh, commissioners does need to be a resident of one of the uh, Housing Authority properties. In this case, it's Ms. Lawrence. Okay, a little more information about uh, what we do and uh, who we are. Uh, we actually own and manage 456 apartments. And in total, we actually serve, uh, when you count some of the other programs that we're involved with, 700 households. Probably more I put plus, because that is a little bit of a moving target. And an interesting tidbit, for the units that we own and manage, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second, uh, we don't receive any direct ongoing operating subsidy um, other than some tenant money that's available to assist some of the elderly and congregate uh, Mark Twain residents. It's only the Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher program that's federally subsidized. Our main focus uh, is on our four core programs, I call them. Uh, moderate rental, also known as family housing, elderly disabled housing, congregate housing, which is Mark Twain, um, and then the Housing Choice Voucher Program, also known as the Section 8 Program. 
Uh, I, I like the pictures. I've come across through the files some, some old pictures. And uh, according to what's written on the back of the picture there, that's uh, Chester Bowles, who was the governor back in the 50s. And this is actually from the brown graking, uh, the authority's first site on Green Valley Drive. Um, and I got to do a little bragging here. Uh, we are considered by both HUD and CHFA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, to be a high-performing agency. You'll see the word sustainability throughout uh, much of what we do. The focus of the Housing Authority for the last probably seven, eight, nine years, or definitely since the board adopted the vision and mission statement in 2013, uh, we've sprinkled the word sustainability throughout because it is our goal to make our housing programs not only high performing, but to be sustainable uh, for the long haul. I won't bore you reading these. So a little bit more about the individual programs themselves. Um, I'll start with the elderly disabled program. We actually have 280 units, um, 200 units, actually. It originally was um, 240, but uh, when Windsor Court was redone and redeveloped, it was brought down to 200. They are throughout four different locations here in the town. And the eligibility is for individuals that are 62 years of age or older or disabled. Actually, the state of Connecticut defines uh, elderly to include individuals that are uh, considered to be disabled. Um, interesting enough, it's not a fully subsidized program, as I mentioned before. The way the rents are set, the residents either pay a base rent, or some can view it as a minimum rent, or an income rent, whichever is the higher of the two. So if somebody has a, a greater stream of income, their rents could be higher. But in, in really no cases other than uh, the ERAP, which I'll get into in a second, everybody would be at the base rents. And those range about 362 to 441, depending on the unit, depending on what utilities are included. Um, bore you with another fact, our revenue per unit really comes in only about $417 in that program. So we operate a little thin. Got a little caveat here. Some of the elderly disabled residents do get some assistance from the state of Connecticut through the Elderly Rental Assistance Program, but unfortunately that program uh, financially has been frozen. We haven't been able to add any new participants in, in probably three or four years. Here's the sites. Um, some of the pictures are better than others. I'm not the best photographer, so please bear with me. Um, at the top, you have Woodside Park. Uh, that's Post and Raffia. Uh, down below is Ella Grasso Manor, so if we were able to look out the window across the pond, you'd see it there. Windsor Court, all the way down the end of Windsor Street. That one's kind of hidden. I mean, you, you folks from Enfield know where these are, but for those that uh, are probably viewing at home may not. Uh, you wouldn't know it's there until you get to the end of the street and you're looking for a place to turn around. And then there's Enfield Manor uh, right over diagonally across from the high school, which I'll talk about at the end. Congregate living, uh, most people in town refer to it as Mark Twain housing, and that's a great program. Uh, the congregate program has 82 units, uh, 62 years of age, and I put this in quotes, this is the state um, wording, for individuals with difficulty or one or more daily life functions. It actually had the word elderly in there, but I, I didn't want to put that in writing, because anytime I say elderly, um, uh, or no, I'm sorry, frail elderly, I can feel my mother like reaching down and slapping me upside the back of the head, so I try to avoid that. <laughs> but what's interesting about Mark Twain is that there's some enhanced service component there, and we staff that site 24-7. Uh, there's the meal program, which is a, another partnership we have with the town. Um, and, and some other enhancements that we do there. We have a program with Bay Path for, for OT and, and uh, occupational therapy, et cetera. Um, originally, that was a partnership with the town. Some will remember the old Mark Twain Elementary School, which was the original 42 units. Then another 40 were added later on in the 90s and then the uh, adult day center. Uh, the rental rate there, 426 to 496, and that's including all the utilities. And then there's a monthly service fee for some of the other enhancements I talked about, which is 305. Uh, all said and done, in my opinion, it's, this is a jewel of a program we have here in town. I know a little bit about some of the private assisted living facilities. They may offer more and, and far as services and things like that, but at much, much higher cost. Modern rental uh, is Green Valley and Laurel Park. That's where the Housing Authority started. I look at this as kind of almost like workforce housing. It's been around for quite a period of time, uh, developed in the 50s, first with the 84 units along Green Valley Drive, then later on the 90 units of Laurel Park. And when I say Laurel Park, I'm referring to the street Laurel Park and that section of Nutmeg and, and then over towards the high school on Pearl Street. All duplex apartments, 
Internally, we often refer to it as family housing because of the makeup of two bedroom, three bedroom apartments, although we do have one four bedroom apartment. Um, with that, uh, same thing, base rent or income rent, whichever is the greatest. Uh, there is no ERAP type of program, so in no cases will somebody pay less than the base rent, which is 378 for a two bedroom to 458, or again, could be higher if somebody's income stream is higher, their rent could go all the way up to the point where it's beyond what the market is, which is the incentive for people at that point to move out into the private marketplace. And we do have many people over time who end up buying homes or moving out to the market. Um, and our average revenue there is about 450. Again, we operate these relatively thin. Under the picture, I put a, a figure there. Um, 86% of the households in the moderate rental program derive some, if not all, of their income from um, employment or wages. And I'd like to add that because sometimes people have the stigma, oh, okay, if you're living there, you're not working or anything else. And that, that's simply not the case. The vast, vast majority of folks are working um, uh, at least part-time, if not full-time. And lastly, this is probably the most complicated program. Uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is the is known as Section 8 more commonly. Uh, it is federally funded, it is tenant-based assistance, and uh, the way it works is an individual will get a voucher, and then they take that voucher to the market, to a private landlord, apartment complex, whatever it may be, um, and then they only have to pay 30% of their adjusted income towards rent. Again, that one is on a sliding scale, so it could go from a very low number to a higher number. Uh, and then the, through HUD's program, the balance between the fair market rent and what the, um, uh, their 30 percent is covered under the assistance. In Enfield, the housing authority here, we have 136 baseline vouchers that we can work with. There are actually 55 others that we manage that come in from other jurisdictions. To me, that's a telegraph that there is a need for affordable housing in the community that, that folks are are getting their voucher from somewhere else. They could already be from Enfield, but get on a list and take it back into Enfield. The flip side is we only have five going out to other places. Little caveat, some of those, so actually we do manage are in East Windsor, uh, we're in Mill Pond Village. Uh, we have a number of folks that are over there. Uh, this is a new program, the next one. Um, there's a program called VASH. Uh, we have just picked up five vouchers that are intended to help homeless vets. Uh, which, is a, which is a really good thing. It's a new HUD program. We jumped right on that. We picked up five. We're in the process of issuing our first two. The, the, the caveat with that one is, is that we don't run a wait list necessary for that one. People have to go to the VA, and then the VA is the one who issues the uh, referral to us, and then we issue the voucher. The idea is because it's intended for homeless vets is that there's services available, and then the VA takes care of arranging for those services. And lastly, uh, kind of a minor thing, uh, for the freshwater pond apartments over here, that is privately owned and managed. Uh, there is a contract between HUD and uh, the owners and then with us that we manage that contract for HUD. That's what they call project-based. The subsidies, subsidies stay with the unit. But right now, we're actually coming up to the end of our 40-year our, uh, contract term. So hopefully, we'll continue to, to administer just the subsidy. We don't manage it. We don't own it. Although when the town has contacted me about some questions and things like that, we usually are able to help them out with that. I talked a bit about sustainability, and let me bring you up to speed on what we've been up to for the last few years. Um, between seven and a half and eight million dollars uh, since probably about 2012 when we started uh, the sustainability program. Uh, the first one we worked on was with Mark Twain. We were able to get a grant, flat out grant from the state of Connecticut. Um, to do $1.65 million worth of renovations over there. We contributed about 300000 of our own, and we leveraged that out to get about another 1250 from the state, and then some Eversource incentives for energy efficiency. We did windows, uh, we did some doors, we did some carpeting, we did some rooftops, and the older Mark Twain section needed some renovations. We redid the kitchens over there. They originally didn't have uh, full stoves, and, and a number of other upgrades. After that, we moved on, and we were fortunate enough to uh, apply back to the state again and pick up $4.2 million, um, closer to four, actually, from the state. There was some other leveraged money in there to do renovations at Woodside Park, uh, El Agrasso Manor, and then Woodside, uh, Windsor Court. 
I know folks said to me, well, Windsor Court was just done. When I think back, actually, it was 2000 when it was done. <laughs> and so as time goes by, the roofs weren't done. There was things like that needed to be uh, replaced. Fire alarm systems. Um, two of the sites got new windows, energy efficient triple pane uh, glass, repaid parking lots. Um, it, it just came out really nice. Very proud of that one. A lot of work. Um, and then lastly, with Green Valley Laurel Park, that one we haven't needed to go out. Uh, the income stream that we have coming into that property has been sufficient over the years to do the repairs and the upgrades as needed. Most of what we do there is on a rolling basis. Uh, we've done some siding. We've done a lot of paving along Green Valley Drive. And two years ago, we actually did 90 furnaces over in uh, Laurel Park. Um, that was uh, with also uh, never source incentive involved there. I got to give Eversource their due. Um, they actually probably gave us incentives and upgrades and things totaling of that other number I just talked about, about $300,000. But it worked out so well that uh, they nominated us for a Green Circle Award through um, one of the um, Energized Connecticut program and uh, actually did a, a write up about it, um, which I thought was really nice to get that recognition and it kind of reaffirms that we're on the right path doing what we need to do with, with our apartments. So this is a good segue, because I think what everybody really wants to hear is, all right, what do you folks want to do with Enfield Manor? <laughs> um, Enfield Manor, uh, bottom line, is we want to replace the, all the existing structures that are there with two new buildings, and they're going to be more suitable to the neighborhood. And Chris asked that I bring a, a color rise feature in case you can't see it on there. It's a, the same one to give you an idea of what it would look like. And, Architecturally, our intent was to, whatever we propose to do there, we want to make sure that it blends into the existing neighborhood um, away from that modern type of look that we have bordering our historic neighborhood. The existing property was built in the 60s, uh, 64 and 65, functionally obsolete, financially obsolete. Uh, if you've ever been in some of the units, they're very small. Uh, the efficiencies are under 300 square feet. They're probably closer to 275. Uh, even the one bedrooms are only about 400 square feet at best. Uh, and then there was a, the, the modern architecture and design and, and uh, does not really keep up with the historic nature of that area. Try to give you a better idea. I know it's hard to really see from a, a, a print, but off to the left is where Enfield Street would be on this. Off to the right is Route is 91. So what we thought we would do was try to take and pull the buildings in to conform with the setbacks, the current setbacks, as opposed to them being up against the border as they are now, then also take advantage of the contour of the land uh, to deal with the building heights that we have in our zoning, and also push it back on the property as a whole. So if you can kind of envision on the left there at the center, that's where the roadway comes in, and you're looking down, you would see the roadway straight forward, and off to the right you'd have one building, and off to the left you'd have another building. And the artist's rendition over there would be what you'd see on the right. So, except that the the other the right side of that picture would be facing the top of the street. Um, to kind of give you an idea. Again, these are from the uh, the architect's drawings that we've uh, have for the approval plans. And same thing with the other building that runs north-south, where you would see just the two stories on one side, and facing the highway would be where the, the lower level would be, where we'd average out on that two and a half for the zoning. And kind of a floor plan. Um, what I liked about this is they didn't want to have like the bowling alley type of uh, 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 corridor. Uh, you'd have a common hallway, but the units, you'd have a little juts out. It reminds me of some of the things you've seen in some hotels along the way adding in community spaces, um, you know, storage in the site in the basement, um, larger apartments, uh, adequate parking, that's always important to people today, uh, laundry room storage, and then um, a passive walking path through the property more towards the front. So where are we in this? Uh, this is a process that started years ago. We've looked at several different concepts. Could we renovate the buildings that are there? Would that work? No, there's not really a space in the footprint of the site. Uh, we'd, could we put additions on? The same thing. We run into space issues. We still would have the same um, issues of, of, you know, the building envelope, as they call it. Uh, if you're, the site actually, in some cases, had flat roofs, and later on, it ha and the other buildings had butterfly roofs, and they built pitch roofs over the top. So we still would be dealing all of that. 
So right now we're in the local approval process. In fact, I'll be back here tomorrow night to meet with the historical uh, commission. Uh, we do need to see them because two of the buildings slightly encroach over the historic district line, so we need their okay to say, yes, it's uh, appropriate for you to take those two buildings down. Um, and then after that, it's off to planning and zoning, I think on the 7th. That's our next go, no go. If we get an affirmative on that one, then it's, it's off to the races to get the financing applications in. And I say applications because the way deals like this work when you put them together, nobody's just gonna hand us a large chunk of money to do this. We're gonna have to leverage several sources. So we'll be looking for things such as state and federal tax credits, uh, mortgages, maybe some grant money out of the state. And the application process for that would start as soon as we get the go hopefully, uh, with planning and zoning. Uh, application time frame, we'd have to pull it all together with 90% construction documents even, uh, get that ready to go for the fall of this year. And if we get approved for financing, uh, we would probably start construction within 24 months. And then uh, lastly on that one, the best guess I have at this point is about $25 million to do the whole thing. So it, this is a big thing. It would probably be the biggest thing the Housing Authority's done. It certainly would be the uh, biggest project we've done since I've been there. But I do have, um, I am optimistic. I have colleagues in other communities such as Glastonbury. They just opened Center Village, uh, and I went down and toured that. And uh, they were able to do something similar. They did where they added on to a site by adding another building in. Um, it came out beautiful. Uh, similar type of thing. Glastonbury wanted to also keep with the uh, more historic nature and look, and uh, it worked out really well, they just opened. So that get, makes me hopeful that we can bring the same type of success here to Enfield. Uh, this is how you can reach us, or where to reach us. Uh, our main office is right over there on Pearson Way on the corner. Um, if you're going to motor vehicles, um, you, you see us there on the left. Uh, we do have a website, enfieldha.org, not to be confused with enfield.org, because that's you guys. It'll be going up on ours as well tomorrow, just in <laughs> keeping so that people can look. So we're doing, since he isn't you know, under the town, he'll be putting it on his. And then under the managers, I'm listing all of ours there so that somebody has a one-stop shopping. Yep. And that'll and, go up. And there week. is a link up there now. Yes, the town's been great with working on us with that. So we, we communicate often and frequently and, and share the information um, you know, as needed. Uh, you know, a couple things that the people have asked, and maybe I can try to answer this question. The one I've been getting frequently, and we're even getting phone calls, is the partial government shutdown going to hurt or, or your, your residents? Uh, what I can respond to is our residents of the units that we own and manage, no, uh, because there's no uh, HUD or federal subsidy in there. The one that we have to keep our eye on, uh, which can impact not only um, participants in the program, but also landlords, private landlords out there is the Section 8 voucher program. HUD has told us that uh, they have funding available through the month of February. If we get into March, uh, there could be some landlords that aren't going to be getting their payments because if we don't have the money coming to us from HUD, we're not going to be able to distribute that to landlords. Uh, we'll be getting communication out to the landlords before the uh, February 1st, so they have some notice about that, but we remain hopeful that hopefully that, uh, that'll get resolved at some point. It's a legislative session down in Hartford, everybody's aware. Uh, some of the things that we're keeping our eye on, uh, there are a couple bills out there that deal with uh, any landlord, not just housing authorities, ability to screen uh, applicants coming in for criminal background checks. Uh, there's one that would make it prohibited. There's another one There's a sets a look back period. So that's always a fine balance. That's something we wanna, um, we'll probably weigh in on uh, as an industry, or I should say my, my colleagues, myself through the organization. Uh, another thing to be aware of, uh, too, is there's a, a bill out there that would allow housing authorities to expand their jurisdictions to within 30 miles um, to go into areas of opportunities. It's kind of a more in-depth conversation, but something we're kind of concerned about because, um, yeah, on one hand, you know, could we go into other communities and do some work? Yeah, but I don't think the other community would like that if we didn't have their agreement. The <laughs> same thing. I don't think Enfield Housing Authority or the council would be happy if somebody else wanted to come in and the council or the housing authority at least didn't have an opportunity to weigh in. So those are just some of the political things that are happening uh, that we're keeping our eye on at this point. Uh, that's my presentation. I, I can't see the clock, so I uh, don't know how I did for time. Uh, questions, comments? Any questions? Always planned 
ahead of it, and we lucked out by getting that financial help. Scott has always been ahead of, ahead of the game, and he's been a great director, and uh, he has done due diligence for our community. And he, he, <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Ballard. And, and to uh, expand upon that, when the uh, the state was releasing money and it was like ten million dollar increments over a five year period, it was done on a competitive basis. So the housing authorities that were ready to go, uh, shovel ready or as close to possible, were the ones that were getting awarded. And Mark Twain was one of the first ones to get the money. So well, we were we had to we geared up right after that into um, the uh, the next three at the other elderly sites. Downside was it kind of did distract us from from this because we had to put our efforts into the other available money and kind of table this for a couple of years, and that's why we're back again now. Councilor Denny, sorry, you had a question. No, uh, Scott. Would well, the new building now will the rents or <clears throat> or the dollars increase uh, or it'll basically stay the same? Uh, that's a yes and no question, Mr. Denny. Uh, for the existing residents, there's protections that'll be in place. Uh, so the existing residents, and I'm glad you raised that for anybody who's watching at home, they would be protected from um, segueing over to a new rent structure. On the long haul, when you're looking at these type of deals, you're putting together in what they call a tax credit formula, where you have a certain number of units at one rent and another set of units at another rent, so it almost becomes a tiered. So the initial people, uh, no, uh, but as time marches forward, yes, a revenue stream has to be there to support the property. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess my question is, um, when you do this development, will it be done in phases such that it will be less disruptive to the residents? And what's the increase in the number of units from what you have currently to what you envision with the two buildings? What we're proposing for a number of units, I'll answer in reverse. Okay, <laughs> remember. sure. Uh, what we're proposing is to go from 80 units to 99. Okay. And the reason for the increase in units, again, is to build the revenue stream in to support the overall uh, financial picture for the long haul. Uh, as far as um, how you would do relocation, and this is just very preliminary, typically what you would do is you would take half of the site and relocate people over to, to one side of the site and also bear in mind that we do have three other complexes that we can work with, with as vacancies arise. Rebuild one side, and when that side's done, move everybody to the over the other, and then finish the second building. That would be initially how you would do it, because it saves quite a bit on your relocation costs, which keeps the project costs down. Uh, and then if somebody, you, you do have to allow people for opportunity to move close where they were, even within near the site. But that's the initial um, plan. Yeah, because you're looking at probably, what, a four-year look ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, two years to close on a deal <coughs> um, with the tax credits and then probably two years of construction. So it would be that two-year construction period once the, you get things moving. And we would have time, actually, during that period to let the occupancy of the site drop down a bit. And then we wouldn't have to worry about uh, disrupting the lives of as many people. Okay, so we would have, like, a little lull where we would need capacity. Yes, we would go down in, in, in the capacity, capacity on the short okay. run for the long run. Thank you. You're welcome. I love the word sustainability, by the way. It's a great word. <laughs> yeah, everyone should. Every, their whole business, your whole business model should be on sustainability. Curious, you, you mentioned um, folks who you kind of, I hate to use the word, kind of end up buying a home or use the word graduate out from, say, coming from one of our assisted, you know, where they're paying lower rent. How often does that happen? What's the percentage? Where so folks start again, who are working, to your point, who are actually doing the right thing, trying to improve their lives, and then actually <coughs> graduate out, for lack of a better word, to where they're actually you know owning their own home. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I wish I could give you a hard number because I would really need a crystal ball that would help in what we do with our planning. But it helps happens quite frequently when the economy is I good. I would like to know that because I think that's the importance of what we do down in Laurel Street and Green Valley and anywhere else is that there, it's actually there to help people become so to your words self-sustaining. And that's the beauty, I think, that I think we need to do a little better job marketing. I guess that's my suggestion. Sure. And that's what it's really for. And that's those are statistics that really matter when someone, you know, again, pulls themselves up, does the right thing, gets some assistance from government, and then goes and sustains their, you know, grows their lives, which I think is a great story that we don't tell. So I guess it's a suggestion to you that take some credit for doing so. If we have some pretty good percentages out there, that that's really the goal of what we're doing now. And, and you know, when it comes to that sort of housing. There's actually some great um, uh, 
national campaign that was done a number of years ago, probably four or five, called Rethink, and uh, was right. done by a national organization, Rethink Housing. Yep. And uh, some of the footage was actually shot here in Enfield right. at the Enfield Housing Authority. And uh, it, it talks just about that. But I, I don't have a hard number for you, but I can give you some anecdotal stories. Um, when the economy has been better, like it has the last few years, we've had a number of people move out to the private market and, and buy homes. There was one family uh, I, I got to know because uh, their, their son was the same age as my son, so I got to know him on a personal level. And it was, it was great to hear that, hey, we're moving, um, and we bought a house. And uh, or sometimes I'll get that phone call, hey, can you, any suggestions for that? Uh, but it, it happens more often than, than people probably realize. But thank you for bringing that up. And, and, and on the same lines, just a suggestion. Again, I'm not, I know you guys are doing a good job. But if we go and do reciting down on Laurel or Green Valley, can we do some different colors? <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know, I mean. It's, you don't like the two-tone blue uh, and white? Uh, I like variety, okay? <laughs> I like variety. And, and so I, I just a suggestion because it's, it's actually when the, when the, to the, the work you've done with the trees, and I know you've done some work down mm -hmm. on the trees, in the fall it's beautiful. Uh, you know, then let's have a little different, you know, some variation of color when it comes to the society. Just, again, a suggestion. That's I appreciate that. Actually, the last several units we did, we went more of a charcoal gray, more of the more modern colors, because the colors you're looking at there were ones that were done back in the 80s that when yellow and blue right, and tune right. tone was popular. So as we phase it through, I think we did charcoal gray. I'm going to look at one of my staff members. It's like maroon, what does he call it, the brownish, whatever, Carbon tannish, gray, yeah. right? Yeah, some yeah. Of the, the more frequent colors, and then the white trim and bringing that up to speed. I, I agree with you 100%, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and, and, and the last thing, I'll be, and I'll be done. What's our, so how do we compare to other towns in our, in our northern region when it comes to providing affordable housing? How do we rank? Do we rank comparable, we, we high, we low? I would say we're in the middle. We're, we're, not, we're over the 10% threshold that's used in a lot of the uh, uh, statutes, actually, which, which would, has different zoning implications, where, where zoning power is taken away, 30G, I believe it is. Um, I hear a lot of talk of that, but we have, um, we are in the middle of that. I believe Enfield over the years has done their job um, and, and stepping up. Um, the bigger issue, and it's another conversation we could have, is looking at, uh, uh, they call it opportunities, uh, uh, census tracts and things. But interesting enough, Enfield is divided into multiple census tracts, so it depends on who you ask and when. But comparably um, to our surrounding communities, I, I think we've done a very good job. Uh, I think those well. are statistics, too, I'd like us to start tracking, because you're right, I agree. I think we do a very good job, and yet we don't have, in theory, the the hard numbers to back it up. Well, the state of Connecticut does track that, the Department of Housing, and I think some of that information is available on their site, because I know every year they ask right. me to complete a report, and i got to submit it in. So When you get a chance, man, I would like to see if you don't mind. Sure, I'll you point you in that direction. And the reason why I'm asking, because we're going through, I think, some changes with our demographics in town. So do we have programs, or are we able to, through the census, to sort of, when folks get to, a, you know, maybe again to a certain age where maybe they're struggling to be able to afford to live in their home, and before it gets to a point where they can't afford to live in that home, where we can, again, transition them into some of the, again, if this, is, this building goes through, it's going to be a beautiful building. You know, you know what I mean? Start tran that transition. Do we have a transition process where we're helping some folks uh, five years before, you know what I mean? So instead of when it happens, and unfortunately the house you know, may or may not be in a great condition, and then we're dealing with blight and some of the other things that the town has to deal with, just kind of looking at, I mean, do we have that, or is, there, is that something we can develop? Because I think there's a need in the, in the community. I think that that's a, it's a social, more of a social question, a housing set. One of the things that by de building something like we're proposing is to have something that is marketable and desirable to the needs okay. of what seniors want today versus what we had uh, years ago. Um, yeah, because when, when it was built before, it was bare bones and, and very minimalistic, where today right. people want something a little bit more. And from our marketing point of view, that, that's what we're trying to go for. Because if, I, if we build something and, and nobody wants it, right. It, it's dead in the water. Right. Yeah. No, appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Scott, for your excellent presentation. Thank you for the commission members coming and joining us this evening. And again, I think this is very informative going to the past and what uh, and how we got to where we are today. And I think it's important because it's showing where they're going in the future, which I think all of it has been a benefit to the town and will continue to be. Thank you for your commitment to volunteer and, and to help us with this. Thank you, Scott. And it'll go on our website and his and we by the end the of the We wish you the best of luck in your application process. You need all the support uh, I can get, Mr. We wish, you, we wish you the very, very best of luck. Right, you may be you. coming back. <laughs>
Okay, continuing the special meeting, we move. Is this still, I would have to, we have to end this then start. So uh, do we have a motion to enter a special meeting by Councilor Ongar, Second. seconded by Councilor Crisati. All those in favor of closing the special meeting? Opposed, we have nine in favor, zero against. Sorry folks, moving right on. Moving over to water pollution control. Tuesday, 2000, uh, January 22nd, 2019, date is wrong. Um, Council Chambers, 6.30 p.m. Sorry, we're 10 minutes late. Roll call, please. Commissioner Bosco. Here. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Commissioner Chris Crisati. Here. Com Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Denny. Here. Chairman Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Muller. Here. Vice Chairman Suzak. Here. Commissioner Ungeyer. Here. There's nine commissioners present, none are absent. Uh, item number two, under the Water Pollution Control Authority, is approval of minutes. Do we have a motion to approve special meeting October 15, 2018, by Commissioner Denny, Second. seconded by Commissioner Sakala. Any discussion on Commissioner uh, uh, Suzak. Suzak, sorry. There you go. Commissioner, Councilor, uh, I got. I know. Yeah. Uh, there's a correction on, it's page five of the, of the minutes. It's um, the commissioners on that subcommittee are Suzak, Arnone, Muller, and Davis, not Commissioner Bosco. Minutes have been amended. Do we don't, do I have to vote an amendment or just include them with the minutes? No, just, it has been. Yeah. Any other discussion on the minutes as amended? Hearing them by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, any abstentions? Nine in favor, zero against. Motion to approve special meeting November 19, 2018. Okay. By Second. Commissioner Crisati, seconded by Commissioner Sakala. Any discussion or uh, edits or deletions to the special meeting November 19? Hearing them by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, nine in favor, zero against, no abstentions. Oh, sorry, eight, eight in favor. Sorry, seven in favor, two abstentions. Sorry about that. I got the math right, though, nine. So I've improved since last week. <laughs> um, moving on to item number three, public communications. Would anyone like specifically to speak on the water pollution control, anything that goes to the water pollution control? Anyone like to speak on water pollution control authority? Hearing none, could declare public communications closed. Moving on to item four, old business. Do we have any old business for the commission? None. Item number five, new business. Do we have any new business for the commission? No. None. Moving on to item six, items for discussion. Uh, discussion on the upgrades that are currently being undertaken down at the water pollution control plant. Um, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think one of the things I'd like to mention is that I think there's been a uh, consensus on the council to have more regular water pollution control meetings because in the past it was sort of done on a uh, inconsistent basis and also we changed the time it was always done at the end of the meeting when everybody was really probably uh, tuned out at home and and nobody was really concentrating on it so we've moved it up so that it will be done earlier and people at home um, if they have questions from this meeting can follow up or they can actually come and ask them. Uh, the water pollution control upgrade, The I'll just give you a brief update. We do update it on our website and there are pictures and they're currently doing the, the most recent one. We meet every single week in town hall with all of, with our consultants, our engineers, our architects. Um, the state comes once a month and with the contractor. And we have a long agenda that we follow. I will tell you as of today, we had the meeting this morning. The project cost, to remind everybody, um, is about $23,823,000. Currently, we are 14% complete. We did a groundbreaking this October and we expect to be on track to conclude it within the two years. Uh, which was the time frame that we announced. And the total amount paid to date towards that from our bonding, and we are also getting state, uh, well, the federal money, the $6 million clean water grant, uh, to date, as of today, $2,636,734.50 uh, has been expended. We have some challenges. We have some things that have come up recently. We were dealing with them. One is, as the council has been aware, we're dealing with Amtrak. We're required by DEEP. Uh, to be building a berm to protect in the event of a 100-year flood zone. They had some requirements that we've been working with legal uh, to work out with Amtrak. Um, I'll give you a brief update. You all, uh, and it's part and parcel to this, under a contract with the state to accept sewage from the state, uh, there was a formula based on any upgrades to the plant. So they actually pay us to take their wastewater, and there's a set 
agreement for that and a cost. And there's a formula that then would say they would contribute X amount under that formula to an upgrade. It comes to $2.5 million. So as you well know, we've been on top of this one um, consistently every, every month. And we are advised that the $2.5 million amount has to be approved by the state. Even though it's a DOC obligation, it's not in their yearly budget. So it has to go to the bonding commission to get approval from the state. So we made sure DOC submitted it. I had a discussion with them. They said they would by December. The bond commission confirmed uh, in December, early January, that they had received it. And then we passed it on to all of you. I think we've sort of delivered and brought it as far as we can. So we. Um, apprised our state reps and our state senator now to help us make sure the bonding commission puts it on an agenda and then more importantly votes favorably on it. So that's where it lies. I still think they're waiting to see when the first meeting will be. I've heard assurances that we will be on, but again, I uh, urge all of you to make sure you talk to our reps and senators to say, please keep an eye on them and uh, hopefully um, they'll be watching for us and that will be a positive result coming up. Any questions? For Chris. Chris, when's the completion date? Just uh, it'll be October 20, two years from October 18. You know, I just have to say too, it's not it's not really that exciting. People don't, it's really not on the radar like a JFK or a high school, but it's the first real uh, upgrades in 50 years. And believe me, it, it is a big problem uh, when people then go to, you know, use their sewage uh, wastewater treatment plant and it doesn't work. It isn't being received on the other end. So again, it's another commitment to invest in our infrastructure like we have done with the buildings and like we've done with our roads. And even though you know this isn't something people are all excited, there were very few people at the groundbreaking. I don't know how many will be there at the ribbon cutting when we open it, but clearly it's an essential service that we need absolutely to provide to our community. And I think it's important that the voters approved it at referendum. We got a very good contractor at a very good price. And at this juncture, um, all systems are go. There are a few bumps in the road, but as Donna told me, there are in any big project. So we'll just take it in stride. If, I mean, compared to the Vernon referendum, we got a great price. A lot of them are double or triple what yeah. ours are, and some of them are smaller the communities. $84 million? So, yeah. yeah. Any questions for Chris? Go ahead, sir. Yep. If you go to seven, I have an item. Um, so no questions, move on to item seven, miscellaneous. Um, I think some of the concerns in the past were that, you know, the role of council and it's so busy and then probably a, a secondary role being um, commissioners on the water pollution control. So that's where we're gonna try to have, you know, at least once a month an update. I've talked to the finance director. And what we're gonna to try to do this year, and it really hasn't been done in the past, we're really gonna address the budget of water pollution control. Now that it is separated out, we have separate charges, we're gonna have actually during our budget session a budget report separately on water pollution control acting under, under your authority as um, the water pollution control authority. Actual budget deliberations and adopt that before we do the, the town budget so that it's transparent. You can really look at the numbers because this year, NOVAC, and that's coming up for a major presentation um, soon. And like you said, I like to give our viewers a, a preview. Uh, stay tuned, that NOVAC report, again, uh, we didn't just put the report in a drawer. Public Works has worked very hard with the subcommittee and we're gonna implement many and many of their recommendations coming up and there will be a whole hour presentation on it. But part of that is personnel and money to water pollution control. Um, as I've said before, this year we look to be good with the rates, to be able to have enough to start continue to pay down the quote mortgage we owe to the general fund and we need to continue to put aside some money for our rainy day emergency fund but those things should really be vetted out separated from our main budget so you know and the residents know we're giving water pollution control the the attention it deserves to fulfill that function and I think this group is capable of doing it we're giving a lot more oversight than it used to have so I think it's appropriate this time for the council to continue and I'll I'm riding herd over it, uh, finances, and I think that we'll be able to do a good job going forward by meeting monthly and then really looking at the budget separately. And we're going to start that this budget season. Any questions for Chris? You know, I agree. It's only been a year, and we're hopefully now going to get on the bonding com uh, council uh, agenda. We've been talking about this for over a year. Yeah. And just, curi so, just curious, I know with the water, you know, with all the rain we've had, historic rain, a lot of folks have dealt with water in their basement in town, all over town, because the water table's been so high. Is it possible just to give an update? Because I know we've done 
we've been on top or actually ahead of you know kind of making sure the fl- line's been flushed you know and I know I know we've done a Don's done a really good job and his staff I don't know if there's any way we can just update saying here's I, you know I, I'll leave it up to you how to present it but I think just so f- people know that we acknowledge that we've had a really long a big year on rain and we understand a lot of folks have had water in their basement and and unfortunately it's because the water table is so high and that we have made we've actually put even more attention to making sure the lines are flushed all right I'll so, discuss I mean, that I, with I you. mean I just know they've done a good job of it so I just think it's important just to let people know that we acknowledge what is going on from a weather perspective and we're doing we're trying to stay ahead of it which I think is you know again kudos to Don and his staff so noted yeah. Deputy Mayor Suzak I think also even though we have an owner rep for this project that our staff and Chris have been attending, you know, the construction meetings on a very regular basis. And I think it's really important that they're there and they represent the town. And I think it makes things go a little smoother. No, and you know, I, I reflected upon that, Donna, because, you know, with the high school, we had a, a building committee uh, and with JFK, we do. And I was just thinking about that, that with this project, it's not as large, but it's very important and we really don't. So we've taken that responsibility on. And I, I agree with you, having gone to the meetings since the inception, it's, it's just uh, vital important that we're there. The director of public works at, uh, attends with me, our rep from Fuss and O'Neill, Woodard and Kern, and it's important for us to be able to preempt uh, smaller problems from becoming major ones. So I appreciate you noticing and, and I think it's working out very well. Any other questions? Hearing down a motion to adjourn the Water Pollution Control Authority. So Commissioner Suzak, seconded by Commissioner Denny. All those in favor by show of hands. Nine in favor, zero against. Meeting is adjourned. We have seven minutes till the regular meeting.
Tuesday, January 22nd, 7 o'clock in uh, Council Chambers, 2019. Uh, prayer, Councillor Denny. Lord of all, although each of us comes to you <coughs> uh, for our own, with our own faith, we all do for the same reason, to ask your guidance as we conduct our business on behalf of the town of Enfield and its citizens. Help us always to ask the central question, is what we are discussing best for Enfield and its citizens? And then honestly answer to the question in our hearts before we vote. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, roll call please. Councillor Denny. Here. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungayer. Here. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Crisati. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. There's nine members present, none are absent. Item number four, the fire evacuation announcement. In case of a fire, we, we have an exit in the back. You can either go orderly to the right or to the left out the door or through the doors to our left, your right, out the first doors down the stairs and out the door into the parking lot to safety. Item number five, minutes of the preceding minutes, special meeting January 7, 2018. Do we have a motion to approve? Okay. By Councilor Second. Mahler, seconded by Councilor Denny. Any, uh, any changes to the minutes? Any edits? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, any abstentions? Eight in favor, one abstention. Uh, uh, Proceeding uh, the approval of the regular minutes, minutes January 7, 2018. Do you have a motion to approve? By Councillor uh, Councillor Denny, second by Councillor Crisati. Any additions or deletions to the minutes? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, abstentions. We have nine in favor and zero against. Item number six, special guests. Uh, again, I apologize in advance. Nelson Tereso. Very good, Mr. Close. Mayor. Very good. Uh, Welcome, sir. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, uh, consistent with what we've been doing in the past practice is when we have uh, a new employee, especially somebody who's a director or a deputy director, we'd like to bring them uh, forth to introduce themselves to the council and the town. Um, Nelson, uh, we were fortunate enough to woo him away from the state. He's going to give you a little bit about his background there um, and come to Anfield. He's been with us about two weeks. Um, he said we should have the train station built by next week. Hopefully. I'm working on that. <laughs> But uh, he, he hit the ground running, and he understood um, he's part of a good team. Lori Witten, we hired as, as the Director of Development Services. She's been doing great work. Uh, Nelson's going to come in and, and help her and the town. Really, again, I think as you'd like to say, Mayor, you know, again, be the, the locomotive of Northern Connecticut for uh, business and uh, a great place it, it currently is to live, but to make it even a bigger center of commerce and community for our residents and other people. And I think he has unique skills to do it. He'll introduce himself and his background, and he'll tell you what he's been up to. Sure. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Town Council. Nelson Tereso. Uh, I came from uh, the state of Connecticut. I worked for, at the Department of Economic and Community Development. I was a deputy director there of the Office of Capital Projects. Uh, what we did there was administer state-funded bond grants from the State Bond Commission to municipalities and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, things such as infrastructure projects, industrial parks. We did roadway improvements, planning studies, downtown revitalization projects. Worked with not-for-profit organizations on museum rehabs, performing arts theater rehabs. Um, and a part of my role as a deputy director of uh, the Office of Capital Projects, we were required to comply with all the environmental requirements, state procedures, regulations, procurement, construction requirements that the state has to, basically the state has to provide um, as, part of, um, as, part of my, as part of my office, we had to meet those requirements. So uh, I was there for about 14 years. Um, and this opportunity came up in town. Um, I actually currently live up in Massachusetts, so I wanted to uh, live closer. I mean, we're closer to home, uh, and uh, it's a great opportunity here in town. So far, I've been here for, it's my 11th day. I attended today a small cities workshop. It's the um, Department of Housing, CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant Program. I'm gonna be working with the uh, Infield Housing Authority, possibly on a grant application for this fiscal year. So I met today with the Department of Housing to go over the workshop and the 2019 requirements. 
Um, my first day here in office, I actually saw your last town council meeting and um, I noticed that the Opera House players had a special meeting. Um, I actually have been in touch with them regarding their, um, their rehab and their, their proposed improvements at 100 High Street. Um, the state does have grant programs to offer um, the uh, Opera House players, so I've been working with them. I met with them last week regarding a potential good to great uh, grant application, which is um, run by the Commission on Culture and Tourism. It's a grant that provides uh, f grant funding to not-for-private organizations to enhance what they do, and this is a perfect avenue for them. So I, I met with Harry and Susan on that, um, and we are in talks with the um, State Historic Preservation Office on a possible nomination on, of that building on the state or even National Register of Historic Places. So that's one of the items I've been working on. I'm also, I've also been working with Lori Witten on 33 North River Street. Uh, we did a walkthrough of the building last week as well. That's gonna be the hub of the uh, proposed transit center. So there has been a significant amount of environmental assessment work done on that site. So we're looking at potentially getting more grant funds um, for the possible remediation of the actual site, but ultimately getting a developer there as part of the um, proposed train uh, station. Um, I also met last week with the uh, Council of Governments, the Capital Regional Council of Governments regarding various transportation initiatives, introduced myself to the, um, the Capital Regional Council of Governments. So um, it's been a busy couple of weeks and I'm, uh, I'm uh, glad I'm here and I look forward to uh, continuing my collaborations with Chris and Lori. So that's basically it for now. Very nice, welcome. Any questions for Nelson? Welcome. Thank you. Councilor Kusadi. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Nelson, I heard a lot of good things about you, and uh, wel welcome here to Thank Enfield, you, and uh, your, your working partner with, with Lori, sure. and uh, look forward to working with you. Absolutely. So, so what took so what's taking so long for us to get our money on a water pollution control uh, from the state, if you were working on the bonding? Uh, I wasn't working <laughs> on that one. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the one before, sorry. <laughs> No, I'll just add, Mr. Mayor, that I think his his experience and his job with the state put, makes him uniquely qualified to help us because, as you know, there are less and less funds, less and less grants. You have to know where to look, how to do the applications, and you really have to push. And I think he's going to help us do that. Um, I envision, and again, I like to give our little previews, that the next meeting we'll be introducing our new um, assistant town manager who also has a, a background with the state, which is going to help nicely. And we're going to put together, because we've been asked in the past, well, why aren't we going for this grant? Who can help? Well, we're going to put a grant review committee together with our new assistant manager and with Nelson and then with other department heads so we can start to bring this out to our entire organization, it's something we haven't been able to do in the past. I think it'll put us in good position, as somebody earlier said, in the housing authority. You've got to be almost shovel-ready. You've got to know when these things come out how to go after them and be first in line. We did it. Uh, with Chris Dresick with the school on all of the safety grants. We were at the front of the line. We got as much money as a lot of the larger cities because we were ready to go, and we had people in place who knew what they were doing. So I hope Nelson's going to help us accomplish that. And thank you for coming, Nelson, and we welcome you. Thank you very much for having Thanks me. Thanks for coming. Welcome. Right. Item number seven, public communications. Would anyone like to speak before the council at this point? Kelly. Kelly Hemmler, 10 Hartford Ave. I'm here to talk about tolls. So the Connecticut Democrats think that tolls will help Connecticut. First, the cost. This is money that will literally be taken out of the pockets of residents with no re return on investment. I have my own business, and um, I travel to clients' offices in Hartford, Windsor, East Hartford, Granby, and more. Over, the, over a year, this expense will affect my family's budget. What do the Democrats in Hartford suggest I give up to pay you these tolls? That's one of my questions. <laughs> um, I live on Hartford Ave, and anyone who lives in District 2 has seen what Enfield Street looks like when there's an accident on 91. It's a parking lot. That means more wear and tear on our local roads, as well as uh, extra um, public safety costs. Loss of an exit. We have four exits in Enfield. Residents and businesses depend on them. So who gets to decide who gets harmed? The highway going through Enfield is one of our greatest assets and can easily be made our greatest liability. 
I know the town council has uh, no direct authority to stop the tolls. I understand that. However, I hope that you all will advocate for us and pressure the state because, in my opinion, it would be a huge mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the council? Murray. Murray Pitt. Am I doing it right? Murray Pitt. Sorry. Sorry. There you go. I would like to speak about my concerns regarding the tolls in Connecticut. The entire Route 5 is parallel to Interstate 91 and serves as the local business route and alternate for the interstate of the highway. For residents trying to avoid paying tolls, Route 5 will become the main road of travel. By adding tolls and possibly closing exits and entrance ramps, this will mean more traffic on an already congested road. We have all seen what Route 5 looks like when there's an accident on 91. I believe that that is what it will look like every day should tolls come to Connecticut. This will not only cause increased traffic accidents burdening our first responders, but also unnecessary wear and tear. For Enfield residents who are trying to avoid the Route 5 and 91 to local businesses, our neighborhood roads will become more congested, again causing accidents and wear and tear. The residents of our town and state also cannot afford the extra cost of tolls. I believe this is just another tax in an already tax burdened state. I strongly approve any resolution that our town council can implement for the opposition of tolls in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. No one else like to speak for the council? Wendy. Wendy Costa, 49 Steel Road. Um, on the surface, it seems to be only fair to implement tolls in Connecticut to put us on a par with our neighboring states. After all, why should we be forced to pay tolls as we work our way through Mass on the way to the Cape or to Boston, or through New Jersey on the way to the beach, when our out-of-state friends breeze through Connecticut without paying a dime in tolls? But there are several reasons why I'm against tolls in Connecticut. First of all, the differences in toll roads in Massachusetts, like the Mass Pike versus 91 and many of our other roads. On the Mass Pike, exits are 10 to 20 miles apart, and it would be difficult to make your way across the state without getting on it. 91 through Enfield has, what, four or five exits alone? Even if one gets closed, it is way too easy for folks to get off and on throughout the state if they want to avoid the tolls. Even if out-of-state folks choose to stay on the toll roads, the locals will avoid it at all cost. This is going to cause increased traffic on Route 5 and other similar roads. Even if you can implement tolls for out-of-state truckers only, which so far has been deemed illegal, it now seems that it would not generate enough revenue for our greedy state leaders. Do we not think that these increased trucking costs will get handed back to consumers through the pricing of their goods? With the planned tolls on 91, 84, 95, 8, 9, 72, 15, 291, and 691, Connecticut residents won't be able to get to their jobs without being taxed. It is estimated that 60% of the revenue will come from Connecticut residents. Of that, the majority would come from passenger vehicles. That's you and me driving to work, to visit family, go shopping, or whatever. That equates to over $400 million coming from people like you and me. Tolls can be less than seven miles apart. That's not very far. I live in the south end of Enfield and I often hop on 91 to get to locations nearer the border, but not anymore. We will be taxed just going from one end of Enfield to the other. Want to take a quick way to Buckland Mall? It's going to cost you. Want to go to a doctor in Windsor? It's going to cost you. Most importantly, I'm against tolls because I'm against the state adding any additional tax structures or increased taxes to our already overtaxed residents. Connecticut does not have a revenue problem, it has a spending problem. I don't get to go to my employer and demand a raise because I want to spend money frivolously and without thought. I need to live within my means, it's time Connecticut did the same. If our Connecticut leaders insist that tolls are a great idea in order to get our out-of-state travelers to pick up their share of the cost of the upkeep of our roads, then eliminate the income tax, or the gas tax, or the sales tax. Restore funding to the municipalities and eliminate the property tax. 
or increase tax credits for homeowners. Do something to show the residents of Connecticut that you truly are there to represent us and not just there to invent new ways to further reduce what disposable income we may have left. Do it before there's no one left in Connecticut to tax. Thank you. Thank you. You know what else like speak for the council? Judy. Judy Kilty, 83 Abbey Road. Uh, turn it on. Okay. Is this the Republican Party now speaking for all of Enfield? They asked on Facebook today, the Enfield Republican Party, for people to come here with signs tonight to protest something that hasn't even happened. I'm wondering, where did they get this information? Are there concrete plans? What roads? Does someone know something that not everyone knows? When and where was this decided? Is this rumor or fact? I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse with little to no facts or information. It almost sounds like fake news. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to speak for the council. And I'd like to speak for the council for the first time. And I'd like to speak for the council for the second time. Hearing none, I declare public communications closed. We'll move on to councilor communications. Any councilors? Councilor Denny. Well, first of all, if we're talking about uh, highways and you want revenue to come to Enfield, but you don't want to pay for revenue, I don't get it. The state has to find money someplace. And uh, I agree with Judy. Uh, I don't know where you got any of this information. I never heard anything about 91 having a toll or Route 8. All, we're to, all it was talk about was trucks and 95 and maybe 84. I didn't realize that I was, uh, uh, sta I thought I would, might have been a state representative here deciding if we're going to have tolls or not or something. I, I didn't run for state rep because I wanted to stay on the town council. This is not a town council uh, situation. We shouldn't be discussing highway tolls here or a petition. And maybe if we, we don't like the governor, Maybe if uh, the more we, we vote against the governor's plans, we might not get any revenue. Thank you. Councilor Bosco. I don't know where everyone is, but we received a big study that says this is what's going to happen from the state of Connecticut. Um, I believe it was voted on saying that the, to the tolls are coming. Uh, we all know that it's illegal to do just trucks. And what people don't realize is when you have a truck, it's not a $50 registration like your car. The trucks are two, $3,000 for some of the registrations on them and all the if the permits and everything else you need. But it's been emailed to us. We have it. And I'm going to tell you another thing. To, to say, what are you coming to us for? It's a Republican thing. Well, no, this is an everybody thing because this is going to get into everybody's pocket. And just like the casinos, when the casinos tried to come here, we did a resolution saying we don't want it. And as a town, we should have the right to be able to try to say something as not going to sit on our hands and not stick up for ourselves. Enfield's been getting crapped on by the town, by the state of Connecticut for years. I mean, uh, the, the Governor Malloy there get mad, and he goes and tries to close our motor vehicle back many years ago, and 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 are threatening our uh, colleges. They, they do this to us all the time. But let me tell you, the death of Thompsonville was the 190 bridge. When the 190 bridge came in, the traffic stopped flowing through Thompsonville, and Thompsonville died. In that report, they're talking about getting rid of a, an exit ramp. Well, whichever exit ramp you decide to cut is going to be a death blow to that side of town. If it happens to be the 49 one, because that's the only one that I feel would be the most viable one to cut so you can't get around at all, it would be devastating to that end of town. If you did it to the 46 ramp, it would be devastating to that town. So as a council, I think we should at least have the, the right to be able to complain and let people know down in Hartford that we do not want tolls. Unless, you know, Ed, you want to pay for tolls, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the nice thing is when you're retired, you may not have to go to Hartford every day, but when people have to go drive around, they got to pay. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I can't afford to be paying anymore. And I'm dead set against them. 
And anyone that sits here that thinks that it's a good way of getting money, there is no tax that's a good way of getting money. And that is a tax. And not only that, they're going to raise the gas tax, too, they're talking about it. So hold on to your cheeks, and you know what you're going to get, because that's what the state of Connecticut's going to give all of us. Thank you. That's Crisati. Yeah, in regards to the tolls, we're not saying if we're for or against tolls. There's been no legislation that is on the table right now that has mentioned anything about 91. All right, there's been studies. Yes, we've read the studies. But there's a, I think this is a little premature for us to sit here and make any sort of decision. Do we want tolls in Enfield or not? when there is nothing that's been drawn out for any of us to look at. We can speculate all we want, but until something is there and in front of us, then we should be able to make that comment. But as of right now, we should not even be speculating if we want them or we don't. And I understand that there's a study, the possibility of eliminating a uh, you know, an exit off of, off of Enfield, but there has been no legislation at this point in time. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Well, I guess maybe we just should be a little transparent and tell them we don't want it. I mean, that, you know, if we don't tell them now and they decide that, you know, maybe Enfield would like tolls, you know, it's better to be clear with them that, you know, we feel that this is an unfair tax. It's an unfair burden to any community that has major roads through it. The, the communities that don't have major roads through it, not a burden. But for the com communities like Enfield, Windsor, I mean, you go right down the corridor. You know, I looked at the map. It's 82 tolls. It's 10 to go to the shore. So that being said, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move items A1, A2, B1, B2, E, F, G, and H to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Motion made by Deputy Mayor Suzak, suspend the rules and move items to miscellaneous. Second. Second by Councillor Denny. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? All set? Yep. Councillor Ungar. I just have a couple announcements to make of some things that are going on in town. Um, youth Services asked me to announce that the youth have a radio program over at Nuntuck, and they're looking to interview every one of the counselors. I know uh, Mayor Ludwig has done it, Councillor Crisati has, and so they'd like to interview every one of us, get to know us, why we're here, our opinions about town. So if everybody would consider doing that, they'd appreciate it. Um, also, they're having Narcon training at the Church of Ministries of Love and Hope, and that's January 29th at 6.30. So anybody that's interested in learning how to administer Narcan, should you be in that situation, they want to offer you some training. Also, First Readers is having their trivia night, February 23rd. It's a Saturday, 7 p.m. at Mount Carmel. So I have my team ready. Got some good people on my team, so we're looking for some good competition. So we're hoping for a great turnout. Uh, it's $15 each. You can just show up by yourself, or it's $130 per table. So I hope to see a lot of people there. Thank you. So, uh, Councilor Bosco. And by the way, it's called being proactive. And if, if everyone thinks by sitting on our hands, wishing that it don't come, is, is being proactive. That's what the um, Novak report said. We need to be proactive, not reactive. So let's get our let's get it in now that we know that uh, that it may happen, and maybe it won't happen. And then we may have been getting all nervous about nothing. But let me tell you, if it comes, just drive down Route 20 going on the side of 90 and see how much traffic comes in. And for me. I, I don't really care. You know how much more work that's going to bring me? But I don't want the traffic. I don't want to see the people get hurt, and I don't want to see the accidents. And that's what's going to happen when, when things, get, things ha uh, get backed up. So it's called proactive. And if we, don't, if we sit on our hands, all this is is a resolution. If you guys want them, vote against it. I mean, at least that way everyone knows where we're at. But if you, if you don't want them, at least it's a good time. And, and hopefully 
Tom and uh, Carol and John will think of Enfield when they go there and do some arguing for us. Thank you. Councilor Grisani? Uh, just a couple other announcements. Uh, on February 10th, there's a Fort Chaplain's Mass at St. Pat's Church, which is sponsored, sponsored by the uh, John Masiolik Post, uh, the American Legion. And also on February 13th, in conjunction with the Youth Services, the Enfield Together Coalition, uh, working with the JFK administration, they're going to co-host an event in impacting uh, middle school uh, students, and they're going to be talking about vaping, online gambling, and anxiety, which I think is going to be uh, uh, a, g a good meeting to attend also. Um, okay, that's, that's it. Thank you. Councilor Davis and Councilor Denny. First off, I want to thank everybody for coming and speaking tonight. And Judy, you are right, because on the Enfield Republican Town Committee page, come and say no to tolls. Enfield Town Council meeting, January 22nd, 7 p.m., Enfield Town Hall, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut. Bring your signs, comments, and neighbors. Come say no to tolls, which is great, because everybody should use their voice. My only thing, I wish we were proactive when the Republican Party put someone on this council that chased, followed young teenager girls and scared them. Then you ran an election, put them back on. So if we were proactive a year and a half ago, those two 15-year-old girls and the 17-year-old girl would have never been nervous or scared. So my bit is, is I'm happy everybody uses their voice, but can we think of our community But first? Think of those teenager girls first. I have a teenager child, and I have a major issue with this, and I'm not going to let it sit and go away, and I will not allow it to be swept under the rug. Thank you. Councilor Denny. Uh, yes, uh, it's about uh, when you watch TV and we have some problems and people co are, have com been complaining about some of the, uh, the voices and so forth. Uh, we, we've have we've had money. We're trying to get money into the budget to, uh, and maybe the town manager can expand on it, but trying to get some more money into the budget because what we're doing is we're putting 1925 uh, equipment with 1990 equipment and so forth and so on. And uh, <clears throat> there's has been a lack of funding for this project uh, for us to watch TV and for you to see us at home. So. If you're complaining out there, we're trying to do something about it. I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention, and maybe the town manager can expand a little bit on that. Councilor Bosco. I'm not condoning, sticking up, or saying anything about anybody. But we found out when everybody else found out the first time. The election was already started. He was already in, and things were going. The public of Enfield, with that being out there, voted him in. And, and that may, what he did may have been wrong, and as soon as we found out about it, we took care of it on the second time. So don't say the Republican Party tried hiding anything. It was out there, and it was, and it was a, the residents of Enfield that still voted them in. Any other comments or questions? Chris, I have uh, one thing. Uh, I want to talk. Uh, I know you'll get to this in your, or we get to the town attorney's report. But I just want to be clear for people that the town of Enfield had nothing to do or has no jurisdiction over the vote that happened with the fire district. I understand there was some, again, folks who had some complaints how it was publicized or or conducted. Enfield has no say in how they conduct their elections. It's a quasi state agency. And just want to be clear, maybe we can get to the town. I know you'll on the town attorney report, but I just want to make sure that we're clear that we had nothing to do with how that was, you know, run. It's if they have questions or concerns, they should go to the fire commissioners of that fire district. Just want to be clear the town of Enfield has no jurisdiction over that. Councilor Muller. Real quick, quick update. I want to let everyone know that the students and staff will be back at ACC on Thursday, January 24th, for the start of the spring semester. Thank you. Any other communications? Hearing none. Moving on to town manager report. Uh, in regard to uh, Councilman Denny, yes, we are looking at upgrades, um, some things we have within the budget, and then moving forward to make sure we have a really high quality in HD. I mean, a lot of people come here 
when they do a presentation, we take their disc and we put it on. It, it's, it's direct and it's clear. But when we actually uh, film some of the presentations that aren't part of that, they come out grainy and hazy. And it's a disservice. A lot of people put a lot of time into making those presentations. And uh, we're going to make sure that when our residents go to look at those things that uh, our staff and outside groups spend so much time to prepare that they get a good, a good quality product. Um, so we're working on that. And then the only other matter I would have is the PAR report. Um, you have it in your packet this month. I, you know, review all of them with the directors, and I would just endorse. I know the council looks at them; they are public. There is just a treasure trove of information there. If somebody really wants to know all of the different programs and accomplishments that the town is doing, from public works to library, social services, it's actually staggering. It's an eye opener to look to see how much we offer from the young people to the elderly in this town. I think it's second to none in the state of Connecticut. That PAR report is an incredible document. It's updated regularly, and I think others should look at it. I, I hope our residents. Uh, review it because it really just shows they should be proud of all of the services this town offers and the job that our, our all of our employees do. And I can answer any questions on. Any questions the for the town manager? Councilor Grisati. Yeah, through the mayor to the town manager. Um, and I see Lori's here. Maybe she could maybe give us a little update on the Thompsonville regulations. I know, I believe January 30th deadline for all that to be submitted in Is that she she true? did include some information in the par but if the yeah. council would like through me to her she could answer that Lori stand up and be loud and proud of your accomplishments we did adopt the, the yeah. zoning regulations for the Thompsonville district and we will be um, perfectly fine with getting everything to the OPM office of policy management by January 30th okay great I just wanted to make sure that you're gonna hit that deadline Perfect. Okay. With the OPM today. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Davis. To the mayor, to town manager, I uh, just want to make sure it's known to say thank you to uh, Buildings and Grounds, Public Works, and all that for an amazing job through the storm. I heard from a, a few of the residents saying they couldn't believe their road was even plowed by six in the morning. They said that never happened. So kudos to them. I mean, I don't know. They have magic wings or something, but they're all over this town, and they did an amazing job with this weather and the storm. So if you can pass it along, thank you very much. Thank you, I will. And I think part of our process, too, as you know, um, the Director of Public Works give me, gives me updates and did throughout the course of the storm from before, during, and after, as well as our Emergency Management Director. They all did a tremendous job. We were prepared. It was nice to know that our sheltering operation was available and ready to go if we had reached you know, the real cold uh, weather and that if the high winds had knocked out power, we were ready for that for our residents. And they did an incredible job. And I also included to you uh, the other side of it. But I mean, we've been fortunate. We we haven't had many storms, but a complete breakdown of the cost for every department for the storm and just for our residents at home. A storm such as that, which is a couple day event, and unfortunately it hit on a Sunday and also a holiday, it was about $130,000. But fortunately, uh, we haven't had many storms, so even though this one was expensive, uh, we're still under the budget. But they did do an incredible job. I thank you, and I'll pass it on to them. Councilor Bosco. Through the mayor to either the town manager or town attorney. I'm not sure which one this should go to. Um, I brought it up last uh, meeting about Asplin and uh, the taxes. And I got your email today that was a little convoluted and it seems like it's pretty tough to, to, to understand. But in all fairness, I think either um, Asplin needs to find a different place to park or they need to either figure out a timetable that would get us taxes on these trucks because then it wouldn't cost them nothing because they're going to pay taxes in their town or they're going to pay taxes in our town or they pay us for the spot. Um, Asplund is not a nonprofit. They are a company. They are charging and they are charging Eversource for the services to cut the trees down. They're not going to do us any favors if they cut a tree down for us that may have been questionable. They're still going to charge Asplin for it. Um, wood chips, I'm sure we can get all the landscapers we want if we need wood chips to bring us wood chips. Not only that, we have a pile of brush that we chip our own, and uh, we can have them run it through the chipper one more time and have real good mulch instead of having wood chips. Uh, 
they are going to make money, and the only thing that's going to happen is if we let them park on our property for free, they're just going to make that much more money. It, it, they're, they're, it, you know, if it was Eversource parking there because there was a storm or an emergency situation, that's a different story. But if you are using our property for a terminal, then you need to pay us for the terminal. And if not, they can go somewhere else. And since it's my uh, time at the mic, I'll defer to the town attorney during her report. Uh, but she did do some research on this. It's really a question for the tax assessor more. She did look at it for us legally to give a general opinion, which she provided with you. And I think we'll defer and what the town attorney, she can speak to that. And I think maybe at the next meeting, um, if there's more interest, we could have Della come and give us uh, a full answer because it really is a, it's really a taxation issue and it is a little bit complicated. Right. So and, it's and more that's assessment what I'm saying. I mean, legal. it's either or. I mean, because th for them, the best thing would say is, yes, this truck is going to be here for x amount of days they don't pay wherever they're they're parking their truck now or wherever it's taxed out of now they don't pay the the taxes to that uh town they just pay them to us instead cost them zero if not you know a, a parking spot for uh, a truck that size for a month is probably three to five hundred dollars so you know, we should at least be getting something. If not, let them go to somewhere else and park. I mean, it, it's as easy as that. They could find another venue in town to, to bring their stuff and have their leaky trucks and all the other stuff that goes on down there while they're parking. I'll say. Anyone else for the town manager? Chris, just quick update on the Eversource property in the river. Uh, I reached out the, the last... Uh, We've been doing a lot on that and surrounding properties for grants and assessment, but the last information we had was all of the samples were taken from Eversource. Again, I'll just remind you, there's a confidentiality agreement, but the last information, I put a call into our attorneys who were in Washington, um, but they're going to get back to me that everything is at the lab. We should have those uh, results imminently, and then we'll be in a position to know how to proceed going forward and how to you know, that will open the conversation. It's with two separate private, the, the property next door, we didn't get the grant, right? Correct? Well, I won't get into that. All They've right. worked on a grant most recently on adjacent property, but Eversource is separate. We need that. It's integral to the parking right. for right. a future train station. Moving on to item 10, town attorney report. Good evening, everyone. I don't have a formal report, but I do want to address a couple of issues, uh, several that were raised last time around at the um, meeting on the 7th. There was a question about uh, from a resident as to withholding of permits for non-payment of taxes, and we did send an update on what the the parameters are that the council can do in terms of with, withholding of permits, and it can only be done within the context of a building permit. It cannot be done in land use, although that was the, one of the questions that was raised. The other question was um, to Councillor Bosco's point about the taxation of these construction-type vehicles. You could certainly charge rent or space. That's a charge the whoever it is for whatever space they're using, and that's a policy matter. In terms of the ability to tax, it, it does seem a little bit complicated, but the bottom line is, based on what the assessor shared with me and my reading of the statute, and those, those three sections were right out of one of the sections of the statute, you have to be able to, as the taxing authority, know exactly that the, this um, equipment was there for the three months immediately prior to and on the assessment date. So that's just the way the statute is, and you have the option to do the other, which is to charge either rent or payment for the space. Someone else had asked, it may have been in, um, I believe it was, Mr. Young's correspondence about the Save Our Strand, and that's actually town-owned property, and there aren't taxes due any longer. Once the town purchased it, the taxes are extinguished. So I don't know if the suspense list he had was an older one, but that's been owned by the town for almost a year now. And I think that that's it. Thanks. Any questions for the town attorney? Just, re just to re re reiterate on the fire districts. Absolutely. So out of this, yeah. the, the fire folks, districts are. Folks separate. keep asking about consolidation of the fire districts. Can you just 
I know what we talked about. It's really not a, we can't, it's not the yeah, town run. Right. It, that would be really premature because right. it's as if we're talking about, since the fire districts are independent taxing districts, it's as if someone would come to you and say, stop what's going on in East Windsor. <laughs> I mean, you have no jurisdiction. Right. It's a separate, complete, independent entity over which you have no and, authority. And if people truly believe that's what they want to go down, they have to kind of, from within the district, sort of facilitate the consolidation of a district. I, I believe I, I'd be reluctant to give them legal advice, but I would say basically, yeah, if it's, it's separate, uh, a group with a separate taxing district has to work within that taxing right. district, just like your residents would come to you and say, we're unhappy about something, we want something to change. You can't do it for another town, and they can't do it for you. Okay. Any other questions for the town attorney? Thank you. Item number 11, report of special committees. Any, uh, Councillor Muller? The JFK Building Committee met. The special guest was Chris Sykley from Construction Solutions Group, who helped with the pre-ref. Uh, ed specs were distributed to committee members, and this is what the architects will be using. The projected enrollment is for 1,215 students. The project is a renovate is new with a project budget of $71.8 million. FF&E budget is four and a half million and eight million in soft costs. The building will be completed on August 1st, 2022. That's the goal. Councilor Bosco. Um, DPW committee, subcommittee has been meeting and we, we've been writing all our ordinance over and the snow plowing and stuff like that. Well, today I seen something that we brought up briefly in committee, but it really hit home today pretty good. So I need to uh, make sure that we have it, uh, get it in there for Donald, uh, to, for something inside uh, the ordinance that we're writing. I was witnessed a town of Enfield truck, and the, the business had pushed her snow across the street. And we mentioned that about, you know, you're not supposed to push your snow across the street. Well. This place had pushed so much snow across the street that the town plow had to go plow it. And I watched him the first time he hit the pile and you seen the truck jump and rock over it. And he backed up and I know he hit it at least a second time to try to push that, that pile over. And uh, I don't know if he had to do it a third. So I, I, I was a little bit hesitant on these people pushing snow across the street if they pick their wind rows up but on something like this where the town has to go back out to open a road up that they had plowed across i want to see something in there that they're charged for that because you're not supposed to put it across the street if you do put it across the street you have to be mindful of your your neighbor across the street you know like this person pushed so much snow that the poor guy that had to shovel the sidewalk had to actually shovel his snow that he pushed across the street. But now when the town went back there to go fix it, what happened? They pushed the snow on the guy's sidewalk. Now if there's a complaint, who's responsible for it? The property owner, because he's got snow on his sidewalk that he already shoveled out. So, you know, just like anything, if, if a resident does something and it costs us money, and it costs us money to send the plow truck out there to push that bank back, um, the, the business owner or the property owner of that parcel that pushed across the street needs to pay. So I'd like to see something in the ordinance. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know what the other people on the DPW committee think about that, but I think that's only fair. We shouldn't be going out. You know, they should be ticketed for the, for the, the obstruction in the road. <coughs> and then <clears throat> they need to be uh, charge, not fine, but charge for the cleanup. I know anytime I had pushed anything across the street, I made sure I went and cleaned it up so it wouldn't cause a, a hazard. But this thing was just right out in the middle of South Road, and, and that's not right. Deputy Mayor Susan. I couldn't agree with you more. I have a neighbor who thinks it's okay to pre push it on other people's property. They tear up your lawn. They make a mess. We need to add in that ordinance that you need to push your snow to your own property. I mean, that's the only way around that because you're going to have people doing whatever they think they want to do. And um, it's hard enough with, when you live it's on South Road. You live on South Road, you clear the sidewalk, and the plow comes. 
that stuff's frozen now for a while. So that being said, I think we need to add probably stronger wording that if you're pushing it, push it to your own property. Yeah, well, well like I said, if we have to go back to clean your mess up, then it, it should be charged out just like the sidewalk. You're, you're going to pay to fix the road. Can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead. Was this a resident or was it a contractor doing something? It, it was a business. Oh, and so they the do business. that for a job. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Most of the times they're hired. There's a lot of contractors do that. They pull people's driveways out and push snow everywhere and leave it in the road. And I've seen that. So I don't know if how we get involved with finding the resident or finding the the contractor who's plowing at somebody's driveway and doing that. First time you find a resident, the contractor won't be there a second time. Well, that, you might be right. Okay. You know, I mean, it, 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 this is a property that the the uh, they plow their own stuff. You know, and and, and it's it's. It's it's not right, you know. All he all they had to do while it was soft was go down the road with their plow and just clean it up. The person no, no sidewalks were done at that time. They could have just cleaned it up. I mean, what happens if someone just drifted a little bit off to the side of the road? This thing was was probably a good three feet into the road. So that that, that can't happen. We'll we'll discuss it and as to whose responsibility. But you're right, and also there may be other enforcement by the police. You just can't obstruct the roadway, create a dangerous condition on a travel portion of the road. <laughs> and last, I think people should be considerate of their neighbors. Uh, I think with snow, people say, well, it's going to melt, but it's really like you really shouldn't blow your leaves on someone else's lawn, cut limbs down and throw it on their lawn or, or dump your garbage there. This is similar to that, but I think because it's snow, people figure eventually it's going to go away. But again, if people would just use the uh, do unto your neighbor as you would like to have done unto you, we'd be, we wouldn't need these ordinances, but sometimes in the commercial realm, and sometimes people just are not thinking about it, but we'll look at that and address it. Okay. Moving on to item 12, old business. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Councilor Angar. Thank you. I just wanted to say there's some really interesting and exciting things that are going on in town. Um, the Enfield Public Library, not only do they lend books, but they're going to start lending instruments. So they're going to start that whole program. So anybody that's interested uh, in trying something out and don't want to make that initial investment, you can go and rent an instrument for a little while and give it a go. I mean, had they had that when I was a kid, it could have changed my whole life. I could have been first violin at Boston Symphony. Yes. So I'm, I'm excited to announce that. Also, the Enfield Cultural Arts Commission, they're donating, donating $500 to the library just for that program. Also, um, up and coming in May, we're going to have a competition between seniors in high school and the seniors in town. And it's going to be called Seniors versus Seniors. And it's supposed to be fun and games and just a, a coming together of the generations and make it a lot of fun. Um, we've got a committee going, and uh, I'll be announcing more about it as it gets closer together. But it's going to be a great fun time. Also, the Commission on Aging is having a new senior television show. It's going to be through public access, and it's going to be all topics related to seniors, and it's going to be called Senior Living. Also, uh, they have a support group. I don't know how many people know this, but for grandparents who are raising grandchildren, they meet every Monday. I mean, they're going to meet Monday, February 11th, from 6 to 7.30. And so people that are interested in, in that need to call Heather Benyak at 860-253-5214. So it's, it's a good support group for grandparents. Also, during Christmas time, um, through the Commission on Aging, there were about 10 residents over at St. Joseph's that uh, don't have any family that visit them and they don't get out. And so someone went over and they donated um, some little gifts to them. So I thought that was really nice. Uh, the Enfield Together Coalition, they've been very, very busy. They're advertising all over town for people not to provide alcohol to teens. So all of you have a copy of this. These are going in storefronts on windows, and also these little tents. They want to put them up in doctor's offices um, all over town. So they're working on that. Also, there's a little flyer. The Super Bowl's coming up for all those enthusiasts. And they want everyone to be aware about underage drinking and not to provide it. And so Captain Hall, it was his idea to take a bunch of these little flyers 
and put them in shopping bags. And so a bunch of the youth council, along with the explorers, went to seven different package stores in town and gave them to the stores that the customers could put their purchases in it, just as a little reminder. So they've been very busy with that. Also, the faith-based community is working on getting a speaker. They want to have an event, an event to welcome all the kids in town to come. So they're busy working on that. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Moving on to item 12, old business. Appointments A, 1, 2, and 3 on page 1. We have none. Moving on to page 2 under old business. Appointments 4 through 17. We have none. On page 3, appointments 18 through 22. Again, we have none. Under old business, item B, appointments by the town manager, 1 through 9, we have none. 10 through 14 on page 4, we have none. Item C, appointments for uh, council approved for P&Z, we have none. Discussion resolution on a non-union pay, that stays tabled. New business consent agenda, we have none. Appointments 1, we have none. Appointments C, D, we have none. E uh, remains on the table. We have nothing to discuss, yeah. right, at this point till Correct. the 24th is when they're in New Britain? Right, okay. Item F, uh, school roof replacements. I don't think we have anything at this point. Okay, item 14, items for discussion. A1 and A2 have been moved to miscellaneous. Item B has been moved to miscellaneous. Item 2, 1 and 2 have been moved to miscellaneous. Item C, there's no town manager appointments. Item D, no town council commission appointments. E and F has been moved to miscellaneous. G and H have been moved to miscellaneous. And item I has remained on the table for discussion. Uh, discussion resolution adopting an, op an opposition to the implementation of tolls on state roads in Connecticut. Do I read the, the, uh, the resolutions since we're not voting on it? or No, we don't have to just open up for discussion. So I know a lot of folks discussed this during uh, council communications, but the items on the floor, would anyone else like to speak? You know, that didn't speak through council communications? Is it? I don't know, Bob or anything? No? I know you said no. no. I said what I had to say. Yes, no, and I think, no, we didn't, because we wanted to have a discussion. The point was to have a discussion first, and then also to make sure that we could, we weren't sure if you could have a non-binding resolution. You know, then it's through research. We found out that we actually had one for the casino that was done a few years ago, for example. Again, I think it's to be proactive. If they do go on 91 and it is in print, it's actually part of the governor's agenda, first 100 days. Also part of that is also to increase the state, uh, the state gas tax, which again, we're a border <laughs> town, which affects us more than obviously most of the, the towns in the, in, the, in the state of Connecticut. And this was just to, again, let folks know that this, is, if this goes in and it's, again, part of their written agenda. It may not be a resolution yet or, or re legislation, there's real, negative effect on Enfield and specifically Route 5. And we want to be ahead of this as opposed to behind it. If we can have any influence before they pass a resolution, we want to try to have some influence. Maybe we don't. Maybe it's just, a, maybe it's just exactly what people think it is. But again, I'd rather be on a record bef now before and then instead of afterwards when they go in and then Route 5 becomes an issue or other parts of town become an issue depending on where they go. And so this is all in print. This is all part of their 100-day 100, 100 agenda. And I think we have every right to be transparent with our residents and know there's direct, there's big impact to the town of Enfield if it passes. And if we have a chance to stop it before it goes in, I'm not saying we do, we have every right to discuss it. And that's really what the point was. And then to make sure that if we do pass it, it's obviously a nine binding resolution. And you know, again, do, is that legal to do? And I think that's what we were, wanted to be clear about. And that's why we brought it up for discussion. It's legal. I right. mean, you've done it before. The councils have done it right. a number of times in the last 20 years, and it isn't binding, as has been pointed out. You don't have jurisdiction over the state right. roads, but you right. have a right to do it. No. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sakala. Thank you. Um, I can just say personally that I'm not ready to do any sort of resolution in opposition for it right now. Um, I'm all for being proactive, but I, I truly think that this is premature, not proactive. Um, I think that if um, our state reps and Senate um, rep wants to come and give us a nice presentation on exactly what they want to do on 91, then I would be more apt to hear them out and then perhaps make a decision. But I don't think just saying, nope, we're all in opposition, because 
I don't know that we all are, um, is really appropriate at this time. Again, we're not saying everyone's all in opposition. That's why it's, it's yeah, that's why having a discussion. Yeah. I can say for the record, I'm 100% I'm opposed, so I'm willing to go on record whether it comes or not. Because again, it is a tax, and it's a, it's a mileage tax on folks who drive to work. It's as simple as that. That's what it is. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's a mileage tax for folks who drive to work. Any other discussion? So this is just a discussion item. We're not taking up the resolution. That was the point of it to actually, you know, again, talk about it because it will have impact on Enfield. Which, you know, we're trying to be upfront about that. Anyone else? Yep. Councillor Davis. I agree with Gina, but my question is, are we bringing our state rep and our senator to actually tell us what's going on in Hartford? Like, are they going to come and brief us since they're the ones in Hartford and know it? Because other studies you read, there's like four different things out there that says the pros and cons, this and that. They're the ones in Hartford. So I'm hoping we are because we brought them years well, past to explain everything. I mean, we have an open invi an invitation for them. I mean, we can formally do it. Yeah, I mean, if there's a consensus of council to have give you ha have them come and give you an update on that. Also, they do come this time of year as we're getting closer to the budget to kind of give us maybe read the tea leaves as to what the state's going to do our municipal aid. So, uh, you know, we can talk it over in leadership, and I think it probably would be an appropriate time to schedule them and, and, and extend an invitation for them to come. Update us on legislation they think is imminent and also on what they perceive the budget forecast to be for the state and how it may impact us. Yeah, I think it's a great idea having them come to us and give us uh, the update. Um, like I said earlier, you know, as as of today, there is no formal legislation that's even been brought up in regard to where the actual tolls are are actually going to be. So, until there's something in place, um, you know, but I would like to have them them here to discuss this particular issue uh, with us. I'm not saying that you know for or against the tolls, but I think, you know, more information is needed if they are coming into 91 and um, the, how they're going to affect Enfield. And if they are going to affect Enfield, who knows, maybe there might be some incentive for Enfield. You, you, you never know. I'll so, reach out to them this week and extend an invitation for them to come to one of the meetings in February as special guests. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on tolls? So you'll reach out for invitation, right? Yes. Okay, good. good. So this will stay on the table. Again, I think it's a key item we have to bring up. And I, again, I'm going on the record that I am against tolls, so I want to be on the record for it. Um, item J, Blight Review Committee. So I know this is not yet. We don't. I, we have a pending resolution. This is before the the um, development services. Item J. I don't know, Maria, if anything since the discussion we had, you wanted to bring up. Yeah, I would like yeah. to, if you don't Go mind. Ahead. Thank you very much. This was this latest draft of resolution has a couple of different options. It was put together after the development services meeting. The the earlier on. Uh, in the discussions, probably in the fall, I sent a couple of different options for you to consider. It seemed that basically the council did not want to have um, membership of employees, at least in part. After the development services meeting, there, there was at least some idea that you might want to have members of the council, at least as an option, although it was clear that not everybody felt that way. So you have the option. I think that what I wanted to get across is this is entirely up to the council. We have a couple of different options here, whether you want to have the final say after Blight Review looks at everything or you want the Blight Review people to have the last word. So that's why item three gives an option. If you want the council to have the final say, you'll use the first option in item three. Again, this is for purposes of discussion. And the... Um, Similarly, in terms of the BRC duties, item three indicates that if you want the BRC to have the full authority, you would use this particular number three. So when we were at Development Services, the manager mentioned a couple of items that should be included to give the Blight Review Commission some idea 
with specificity of what it would be considering. For example, we've talked about this, if the the property owner had some specific or special circumstances, someone who was elderly, someone who was um, perhaps in a nursing home. There were other considerations in terms of making sure that the Blight Review Committee at least had information that staff had so that there would be a staff recommendation, although ultimately it would be a Blight Review Committee. So you can take a look at it. I'll try to answer any questions. This was supposed to be taking into consideration the things that were discussed at Blight or at the Development Services um, Subcommittee with respect to Blight Review um, with the option that you still need to make a decision if you want the final word or you want Blight Review to have it. And that's really, that's all I have in terms of this particular resolution. If you have questions, I'd be happy to Any answer questions? them. And Chris may actually have some insight too since he deals with the blight people himself. My only suggestion is so that we move it along and it, it doesn't get lost or, or languish. I would just suggest we had those um, suggestions with um, the subcommittee. I think they were pretty much in accord unanimously with what we discussed. I would recommend you all look at it. If you have any thoughts on it one way or the other, get them to Maria, but she incorporate what we discussed at the subcommittee and actually write it and have that product for the next meeting. It's kind of tough to do it in a vacuum with the different ones. So I think kind of taking the consensus of what the um, subcommittee thought, we should um, have her reduce it down into a uh, what she thinks now sort of reflects that. And let's have it to really look at the finished products at the ne next meeting. I think it'll focus you more. And if we like it, then we can move to actually All adopt right. it. Is, that would be my recommendation. recommendations from the subcommittee in here, Maria? Well, the only, the only issue is whether or not you want to have the last word or not. Okay. I mean, I, you know, that's entirely a policy yeah. matter. Right. Do you feel comfortable once you appoint your residence if that's right. If it's going to be resident composition only, do you want it in their hands? If you wanted a hybrid of resident and council, do you want it in their hands? Or do you want them simply to make a recommendation to you and then you as a council say, okay, we think this is worthy of being waived? Right. So I hope that's clear. It's really well, it's I mean, up to you. Well, I'm not trying opinion, to pass the buck, but it's a policy. If you have a board, then you've got you to give them some power. And I, I like the way the loan review committee is where you have residents set up and then one councilman from each party, one council who then can be a voting member if there's not a quorum. I think that would be a good suggestion, but I don't think they, uh, if they're going to come back to us, what's the point of doing it? I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, I that's agree. just my opinion. If you're going to have yeah, a committee, right. Right. Yeah. if you don't give them any power and they got to come back to us, it's, right. it's, 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 have a it's just another level of gov layer of government that the residents got to go through. Correct. Yeah. And if it doesn't well, seem like it works, we could always change it. Right. Yeah, it, change it later. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know be, being on this committee ourselves, we, str we streamlined it from you know right. from every you know nook and cranny into this into this document and when you look at it it's just the bottom line here you know do we want it coming back to the council for a final decision and no, you know i don't think, so I, I don't think we no. we really want that you know no. uh and i know that some of us are in favor of you know just having the residents make the final determination or to have a council person, like we, it's, which is highlighted, is to have a town council member who wants to be on this particular board, or if we do it, one from each side, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think we should be coming back to the council for a decision. No. We'll, we'll have to actually yeah. pass you pass it though. We have to pass you whatever this make up the committee. We have to actually pass it by or you know by our vote. But I think I agree. I think. Sorry, go ahead, Councilman Bosco. Well, I guess, uh, who do I sit down with? I, I just got on this committee, so I want to be able to get up to speed. fully up to speed. So is it, do I sit with you or do I sit with Laurie? No, what I suggest, um, what we've been normally doing is we wanted to get this feedback. I think Maria now can, uh, I think she has a feel of it. She can maybe do it in the alternative. I, I think kind of the consensus would be, and she could write it one way, that we have residents and one of each council that the last stop will be them, otherwise you're right. If it's gonna to come to you for everything, then why really have it? She could write that and we'll bring it back to the next subcommittee, Joe. You could be there and we go over it yeah, all once want, again. I mean, I want, and then we could- I, I want to get some information from the, 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 the beginning. Right. So I, I, I make a total- well, that way we, we get the subcommittee to look at the final product again, because normally they give us their recommendation. Right. And I think that's why Maria wanted it on, because there were these open-ended questions, and this way she could 
bring it one more time to the committee, write it, and then bring it for the, you know, the next meeting. Yeah, and if I could, just to Councillor Bosco's point, back in the fall when we first talked about this, I mean, it was within the context of the property maintenance ordinance revision. And in that ordinance, we're saying people have a right to go to blight review. The reason we didn't want to cast it in stone was we weren't sure what it was going to look like or how it was going to work for you or how happy you'd be with it. So to Councillor Bosco's point, if you do this by resolution, which was the whole point, then you can go back. If you find you're not happy with it or there's something that needs tinkering or, oh, you know what, we don't need to be on it as council members or whatever, it can be changed much more easily than it can with the process of an ordinance amendment. And, and Joe, if you if you want to sit down with me at some time, I can go through it. With yeah, you. I, I just want to sit down with someone. So you know, it, it's usually anything in my committee I know inside and out. Right. And um, this, I'm. I'll, I'll sit down with. Fits you. in pieces. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, to. I think the goal is we want to vote. I think we want to vote on this by the end of February. So I think we want to move. Yes. Yeah, so I think. We're ready to move. All right. Forward. So I think we're ready to move, and I agree. I don't think it needs to come back. Meaning, I. We don't want to have final appeal. We're going to set up a board, and we're going to you know make and then have I think one count member of each party is is fair. Sort of like the loan review, which I think works well. Of course, then we don't usually get folks to show up, but hopefully that won't be the case here. Okay, moving on. So then discussion tax abatement policy item twelve under item K under items for discussion, and again. I, Maria, we will defer to you on this. I know this is an item for discussion, not a, not a resolution. Right. We had sent, um, our department had sent a memo back in the fall with just basic um, information on how the statute having to do with tax abatements has changed over the years. Many years ago, there were a lot of uh, really rigid prescriptions in terms of what you could and couldn't do in terms of an abatement. Now it's, I'm going to say, almost wide open, but there was interest in the development services committee again to try to have some sort of delineated guidelines so we tried to keep it skinny referencing the statute just to have something that ultimately could be put on the website people could know that um, companies businesses individuals small businesses could know about the different areas where one could have an abatement by going to the council there are we met with um, personnel from finance development services and legal to come up with some factors for consideration, things that the assessor could live with in terms of dollar amounts, um, suggestions <coughs> that the development services director had from her experience in East Windsor, those are in there. Um, penalties only because we've had experience many years ago, in fact, before either Chris or I were here, so it's quite a while ago, where um, Companies had done things where ultimately the town was left in a bad situation. So if you're going to leave as a company after you've gotten an abatement, then um, there will be a penalty for noncompliance. So these are just some of the things based on experience of all the staff that we put together for development services to look at. They went along with it, and this is ultimately the document that you have to look at for um, basic guidelines for an abatement. Any questions? No, I appreciate that. Actually, having guidelines in print is great. It gives right. It still comes down to the individual negotiation with the with the company or or entity. So I think it's at least from some general guidelines is nice. Right. Where and will we put this so the uh, so an organization can look for it? You could put it on the. You could certainly put it on the development services or finance or wherever the manager right. thinks it might belong. No, no. I'm saying I don't this think is a draft, this is just a draft. I don't it's think we're draft. voting it right. Right. It's just yeah. a draft. And notice that in bold, you know, these are guidelines. There's no requirement that just because someone manages to check off the boxes, you're obliged to then give an abatement. And by the same token, maybe there would be some special circumstances where even if they didn't check off the boxes, you would think, oh, this is a good startup or this is a good risk or we want to encourage this kind of development in town. Right. So it gives us, gives us if we, you know, we're, we're, so this would be a resolution to vote for the guidelines, or do we just agree? I mean, I don't, do we actually have to vote for the guidelines? Because all we're doing is just setting up guidelines. We're not saying this is exactly how an agreement is going to work. It still gives us the flexibility within each agreement. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, do we physically have to vote on this? Or is this just something we? 
well, I think ultimately you would probably you would probably right. want to as a council okay. yeah, adopt yeah. it as the town council policy. policy right. You know, we do get inquiries. People want to know, do we offer them? And we do. Uh, so I think this is just codifying that, and it's someplace they can look, or development services can point it to them and say, this is it. And again, I, I think this one's pretty much ready to go. Look at it. I think it's been well vetted. Um, the subcommittee uh, was looked upon it favorably. I think because this isn't so specific, it's so much more general that this is a good template to use. If anybody has specific... So, uh, Bob's saying the development committee, they looked at so uh, this could be on the agenda next Right. Meeting. We okay. wanted you to look Perfect. at it again. Yep. This one's a little easier. Yeah. I think yeah. um, Maria did a fine job in shepherding this one through as well. And that look at it, if you have a specific suggestion, make it. But otherwise, she'll, she'll finalize it and we can put it on for the next agenda for adoption by the council. Great. Any other questions on the abatement? Okay, moving on to miscellaneous. One second. We have two items for the uh, consent agenda. Uh, transfer funds of $250 for personal services and development services, and then transfer of $9,000 for the temp that's ongoing in a building committee. Do we have any discussion on <coughs> the consent agenda? Any discussion or opposition? Items 1A or 1-2. Hearing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We have nine in favor, zero against. Moving on to appointments, town council. Uh, item B1, council at large. Do we have a nomination? Councilor Bosco? I'd like to uh, nominate Carl Sferraza. Um, I think uh, he is going to bring, bring experience, integrity, and uh, a wealth of knowledge to the council. And I'd be enjoy sitting here with him. Um, second. second by Councilor Unger and Councilor Denny. Go ahead, if you want to go first. I just think he'd be a great addition. Councilor Denny, sorry, to, if you have anything. Uh, okay, just one minute. It wasn't. Uh, yeah. have, is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. By Councilor sorry. Muller, seconded by Councilor Deputy Mayor Suzak. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed? We have nine in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Denny. Carl Sparazzo. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Carl Sparazzo. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Carl Sparazzo. Councillor Grisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item B2, uh, vacancy exists. Do I have a nomination? Councillor Sakati. Uh, Grisotti, sorry. Yes, uh, I would like to nominate uh, Bill Kiner uh, for the seat on town council. Um, Bill is a you know, former state representative in the 59th district who served the Connecticut General Assembly uh, for 16 years. Uh, he will be a welcome member to this town once again. You know, you're dealing with somebody who served the, the town of Enfield for number of years wanting to get back into helping our town and uh, uh, integrity um, you know once again um, he'd be a, a welcome person for this uh, Nominee position. Councilor Krasai, do I have a second? second. Councilor Denny. Motion, Motion closed by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Seconded by some uh, councilors to call. All those in favor of closing nominations by a show of hands. Opposed, nine in favor, zero against. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Denny. Bill Kiner. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Bill Kiner. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Bill Kiner. Councillor Crisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Moving on to item E, discussion resolution, request for transfer of funds for the police department JAG grant of $15,000. Resolved in accordance with chapter six, section eight F of the town charter, the following transfer is hereby made. Two grant funded projects, JAG grant fiscal year 2019, new equipment, account 3110882-573000, from grant funded projects re revenue fiscal year 2019, federal JAG grant revenue, Account 3110400 460986 of 15,000 
dollars certified that the funds are available on january 10th 2019 by john wilcox the director of finance approved by chris bronson tom andrew on 117 2019. so moved so, moved by councilor muller seconded by deputy mayor suzak um chris just quick on yes this is to uh up date our in-car camera system, which is quite old. Uh, this is the first step in doing so. The police department um, was proactive and they sought out this JAG grant, federal money, it was approved. So this is transferring the money from the grant to the PD so they can make this purchase. Perfect. Any discussion? Hearing on roll call, please. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzanne. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Oh, sorry. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Casati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. There's eight in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item F under miscellaneous, a resolution waiving bid requirement for bright computers. Resolution waiving for bid requirements for bright computers to provide and implement the Vigilant license, Vili li license Plate Reader Solution, whereas the Enfield Police Department is replacing the Vigilant License Plate Readers to current supported models, and whereas the Enfield Police Department will utilize the pre-qualified subcontractor, subcontractor with experience in the implementation, integration of all necessary equipment, and with a staff who are familiar with police operations and possesses the knowledge and ability to solve all issues that may arise, whereas Bright Computers is uniquely qualified to coordinate and deliver these services to the Anfield Police Department based on a significant knowledge and experience with the systems being utilized and experience with the unique needs of police department of a police department as well as familiarity with the systems surrounding agencies. EPD seeks to integrate with and whereas Bright has been in identified as the only organization in this region with the knowledge, infrastructure, and pro programmatic experience to successfully provide these services. Now, therefore, be it resolved in the accordance of ch Chapter 5, Section 8, Paragraph D of the Enfield Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby determine that it is against the best interest of the town to require competitive bidding for the Enfield Police Department license plate reader implementation inter and integration to the state's public data safety network, PSDN, Date submitted on January 11, 2019 by Paul Russell, our Chief Technology Officer. By Councillor Muller, seconded by Councillor Crisati. Uh, briefly, the LPR stands for License Plate Reader. This is a system we implemented several years ago. When you saw some of our uh, cruisers, they have a lot of different, it looks like cameras and different apparatus and radios and antennas on the vehicle so they can get like a 360 perspective. What it does, our Department of Motor Vehicle has a registry, it's online, that this will read the plate of a license plate. And if the person is unregistered or he's wanted for a crime or has other motor vehicle related lapses, no insurance, no registration, as I think I said, it will will pop up and that's a predicate to stop. It has been highly successful. The software lapsed. This is really the, uh, we have the money in the budget and this is a waiver of the bid because these people are the only game in town. They're the only ones that do it in New England. They did the initial um, uh, software for us. Um, they are part of the Connecticut program that the state uses and also Krog has used them exclusively since 2009. So it's in our best interest to get those back on the road. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Here none roll call. Ooh, Deputy Mayor Suzak. Now, Chris, in the future, this is going to be in the IT budget instead of the police budget, so it doesn't, you know, sometimes we forget. I mean, IT, like, controls our world. Bless you. And uh, we forget that there's all these licenses, and it's nice to have them in one place. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, that is correct. I've seen that there's sort of been like a, in different departments, sort of a creep. We're seeing it uh, in, in one of the, with the NOVAC implementation study. DPW's looking, they found a good system to do tracking and, and reminding and whatnot, but Paul Russell just happened to be there to realize, well, he wasn't in part of the process. So this year I implemented all the departments for CIP across the board. Everything software and uh, IT related will go through um, IT and they will be the repository for it so that licenses don't lapse software you know uh, in a given year such as this a department director might say well I'm not going to renew that because it's too expensive and we lose a valuable program well now it's going to be in IT they'll budget for it and we don't we won't risk losing or lapsing or spending more or buying a product that isn't compatible with what IT thinks we should have so we've implemented that this year and, and, and thank you for mentioning that Roll call, please. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. 
Councillor Davis. Four. There's nine in favor and against and no abstentions. Item G under miscellaneous, a resolution adopting the Register of Voters Administrative Assistant Job Description, resolved in accordance with Chapter 7, Section 2 of the Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby amend the job description for the position of the Registration of Voters Administrative Assistant, submitted on January 11, 2019 by Steve Belinda, Human Resource Director. By Councillor Muller. Seconded by Councilor Crisati. Again, updating our job descriptions all well, across. Bit, our, right? Bit, right. Again, there's no budget impact, right. but the person who had held this job for a while left, and the position's vacant. And, and HR and reviewing it to advertise realized there was no job description. Yeah. So this was a, created in conjunction with the two registrars and reflects the duties and responsibilities of that job. So we can go out and fill it. Roll call, please. Councilor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzanne. Four. Councillor Ungayer. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Grisotti. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item H under a, a miscellaneous, a resolution to settle pending tax appeal, appeal Nerva, Inc. Uh, resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby authorize the town attorney, Maria S. Elderson, did I say it right? Of her designee to settle the outstanding tax assessment appeal in the following action. Nerva Inc. versus the Town of Enfield, docket number HHB CV 17 604 3584 S. The fair market value of the property known as Five Hazard Ave to be $2,042,860, $4,042,860. Dollars prepared by the Office of Town Attorney on January 2019. By Councillor by Muller, second by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Simple, this is just the tax appeal. Yeah, I, I basically I can give you the, the, the short version and any other questions can be deferred to the town attorney who negotiated this, but this was a tax appeal. Um, there, was a, there were pretrial discussions, our assessor was involved. Uh, they feel this is a very uh, reasonable reduction. It really reflects, there's information when you are doing your appraisal, some things aren't uh, known yet their estimates such as occupancy levels so estimates were done when they actually had set the assessment and then the actual occupancy um, uh, data came in which were lower so this reflects that change uh, Della is in support of it I know the town attorney is and I thank them for their their efforts uh, to bring this to a good resolution to the town any questions here on roll call please Councillor Denny four Mayor Ludwig four Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Susan. Four. Councillor Ungaya. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Prasadi. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. There's nine in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item 16, public communications. Would we like anyone to speak for the public at this time? Judy. Welcome. Judy Kilty, 83 Abbey Road. Um, first, I would like to thank Governor Lamont for working with Webster Bank to give the furloughed employees an interest-free loans, which is a very classy thing to do, and it shows his deep respect for the residents of Connecticut. Um, regarding the former councilman, Mr. Bosco said that we knew about him, including the mayor, the deputy mayor, Mary Ann Tuner, we all knew about him, but they voted for him anyways. To admit to knowing the circumstances and allowing and even appointing him to work with young girls is certainly nothing to be proud of. There are some things more important than winning elections, and that includes integrity and safety. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else like to speak for the council? Hearing none, declare public communications closed. Item 17, council communications. Councilor Bosco. Let me make myself clear. What we had found out during the election was nothing with little girls. It was grown women. The same thing your everyone else's husband probably had seen before somewhere else. That's what we found out about. It was out in the open, put on Facebook, whatever. The public knew about it. At that point there, we are, first off, we are only humans, for one. Two, we have someone come in, and they put their name into something, and it's already, everything's all in motion. You, 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 it, it was out there. The voters are the ones that wanted them. Not us. We, we, we put it together, the, the party puts together a crew, and 
it's a group of people, but it's up to the voters who they're going to pick. They like Peter better than the last guy that went out, too. So to say that we knew about these little girls and they're, they're, they're teenage girls or whatever, that is not accurate. And for the next part of that, as soon as we found out, we asked for a resignation. As soon as we found out, we and the resignation didn't come, we asked and got rid of them out of our caucus. So we were very proactive when we found out about the second thing. The first thing, it was on Facebook right along, and all the residents voted for him anyway. So, you know, to say Republican, Democrat, there was someone else on the Democrat side that we could bring up that had something that was pretty bad, but no one brought it up. We didn't bring it up, and I'm not going to bring it up no more. Certain things, just you can't say Democrat, you can't say Republican, they're people. And if you could be a, you could be a good Republican, you could be a bad Republican. You could be a good Democrat, you could be a bad Democrat. But you can't put everyone in this Democrat versus Republican. He's a person. He has his own choices. He made a bad choice, and now he's paying for it. And to crucify him over and over and then try to blame the Republicans for something that another human being did is not right. It's just not right. Councilor Cassati. All right, on another note, um, I just want to make everybody aware of, uh, through uh, Department of Social Services, Enfield Cares uh, Community Access, uh, Access and Resource Emer Emergency Service. This is a registry, it's a voluntary program that's going to help um, with the Enfield residents learning more about town programs and services to make the staff aware. And this is what, what it looks like here. And it's offered through the social services. And the other thing through um, the town of Enfield on the Commission on Aging, uh, back in 2012, they came out with a booklet. It's a resource booklet. And I know at the last meeting, uh, it was brought up that they would like an updated, that they're going to put, put out an updated version, and they're looking possibly for some assistance uh, with this particular booklet for the distribution out to seniors. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Thank and you. I just want to comment on the, the, did they vote today on where they are going to grant low interest loans to federal yes, employees? We received, we passed it on, but it was late in the afternoon at 402 that the legislature passed and the governor signed. Uh, the proposal so, so I which, mean, I want to be clear. I mean, when we start picking and choosing winners in taxation, anyone that loses their job should be going to the governor again, asking for that same low interest loan at the federal. Who are not losing their job, by the way, they're not losing their job. They miss, miss I'm not saying they aren't missing a paycheck. But again, where was Webster Bank when we have 400 empty homes in this town? When folks w probably went to the banks looking for any kind of loan they could get when they lost their job, and they didn't get it. So again, we start picking and choosing taxation winners, we're going to have a real problem collecting taxes from anybody because everyone has a sad story. And everyone, again, may, get, may have lost their job, may have not, I mean, have gotten their health care, the cost shifted to them, whatever it may be. This is the danger of doing this. And I, I'm from a, I don't know if it's going to happen, if they're going to punt to the town, you know, if we're going to delay collecting property taxes, why aren't they asking to delay the income tax as opposed to kicking it to the town and can we look if it's legal for them to even accept that because as a federal employee you're not supposed to take gifts which is a clearly big gift so i want to make sure that a before we do any of that and it comes punting to us once that's voted that we're prepared i'm sure other communities will be looking at it what the legislation did is allow us to develop a program so it would be up to the council so we'll we'll get more information we'll talk to leadership to put it on the agenda and then you know consistent with your uh, instruction if you want us to try to put together and I'm sure the communities will be doing it a resolution then it would be for your consideration but it isn't automatic the local government would have to adopt it so we'll keep you apprised and I would just like also to say on a positive note that um, it is I know the intent of the council to swear in both Mr. Safraza and Mr. Kiner at the next meeting and I think that that will be exciting for them to come be sworn in by the clerk and I would just like to commend the council on picking two exemplary individuals with a wealth of knowledge who I think will really contribute to the council I think it's a testament uh, to bipartisanship tonight that you chose two really really fine people with all of the years of experience I know they'll put the town of Enfield first and I for one and the staff are really really looking forward to working with them thank you do have a motion to adjourn? No. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you.
First, I want to announce already the Warman Center at the Holy Trinity Church on 383 Hazard Ave is open. So if anybody knows somebody that's homeless, please get them there. Nine o'clock, they open the door so they're out of the freezing cold. And also, uh, Joe, I, I personally want to thank you for being honest and saying once you finally found out it was teenagers, you asked for his resignation. Thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. So I publicly want to say thank you for wanting his resignation, for seeking out any minor child. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ed. With this Enfield Cares thing, uh, I think we've been discussing this at uh, the Chiefs uh, Association and uh, with, the, with the police and the fire department. We're trying to put, we have a list of people, and some of them, of course, have passed over the course of time, of people that we uh, try to uh, know that live in the districts or whatever district they live in or wherever they are. Uh, if you if you people are listening out there, if you fill this thing, this form out and submit it to the town, we'll put you on a list of, you know, uh, your name and address and uh, your special needs or something. And if there's a disaster or freezing cold or the power goes out, we know who you are. And that's what this is about. Uh, and so we'd like to have people fill this out and uh, <clears throat> and submit it to the town, and we can get you on our uh, and the police or the fire departments can get you on a website, and uh, then they know where to look for you. Thank you. We've put it up there, but sometimes it takes a little while for this Correct. to disseminate. We haven't had a big response, and uh, social services and Dawn did a really fine job of putting that together. We hope people will take advantage of it. And again, another preview. Um, at our next council meeting, we're going to have the EMS here. They've done a really fine presentation on EMS. I promised Joe I would look, and I've met with the fire chiefs. We're meeting again this Thursday about their role in EMS. This is the first step to kind of discuss it and let our residents and the council people know how the system works. And I've invited the fire chiefs to come as well because they're part of it. So I think that that will be very um, uh, educational for everybody, and that will be at our next meeting. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Motion. By Councilor Denny, Second. seconded by Councilor Crisotti. All those in favor? Opposed? Nine in favor, zero against. Good night, everyone.